All right, boys and girls, it's time once again for Grease the Wheels. This means it's Uncle Jimmy time. Spewing stuff into a microphone here in a greasy, grimy, grubby basement in Rochester, New York. A few miles northwest, or northeast, excuse me, of the Rock and Roll Garage. A little cold out there this time of year, folks, so, you know, you don't want to hear me shivering. I don't I don't want to hear me shivering, so we're going to do it in the warmth of a cozy basement. And you know who's here right now? Is our producer. Hey, what's going on? Hello. Hello. This is Eric, hey. the producer. Hey, you know what? We're going to be talking about models today, not makes, models, because some of the models of cars are extraordinarily important to their manufacturer. So when you have a make, you have a model. So a make is like Chevrolet and a model would be like a Chevelle. In this particular case, we're going to be talking about BMW and we're going to be talking about the 3 Series, which uh, if you talk to a lot of people who have 3 Series cars from BMW, they will tell you that they're extraordinarily important to the history of and to the development of them as a premium brand and as a good, maybe even great car manufacturer. It depends on your opinion of them. But you're going to hear our opinions of the three series cars that they've built over the years, uh, over the course of the next probably hour or so. And uh, so settle in, get yourself a, what, what are we drinking today? Well, okay, so I totally fucked up because I thought I was grabbing a Diet Dr. Pepper cherry. It was a PBR, and now it's too late to turn around. So I am drinking a PBR. Yeah, monkey. Yeah, it's uh, that's a that's a freebie PBR. Hello, <laughs> folks. Can you say elevated blood alcohol count? Yeah, this could make this a classic. It could be good. Grease the wheels episode. Okay, so stand by for the BMW 3 Series make. We're gonna go. We're gonna dive into it here. Okay, and uh, you know what? If you're not interested in BMWs, then you know go ahead and turn it off. But I think if you if you uh, if you pay attention and you listen to what's going on here, we're going to fill you in not only on really what goes on with BMW and as far as a particular model of their car, but also some of the other German manufacturers and what goes on with their cars because they all have a fairly similar experience starting at about the same time. And it also gives you an insight as to even, even as far as domestic automakers go, what they're shooting for. Because the 3 Series was... At one point in time, it was extraordinarily successful and actually changed the way people viewed and people bought and sold uh, European cars. It really was kind of a turning point and uh, got a lot of people behind the wheel of a German car that wasn't a Volkswagen Beetle, which yeah, is abs- always a good thing. Oh, absolutely. Get, yeah. get out of that fucking Beetle. But it's really interesting because the predecessor to the 3 Series actually basically saved BMW as a brand. Yeah, they were struggling in the 60s big time. Mightily. And almost mightily. sold out to Mercedes-Benz, which, you know, today would be unfathomable. It would be something you couldn't comprehend. But back in those days... It was real. It was real. real and it was on the table, and it was almost done. And uh, we actually have, uh, I think it's, was it William Clay Ford we have to thank? Yes. For advising the uh, Qantas family that owned BMW, and I believe they still own to this day, advising them that they should probably stick it out and and move forward with the BMW as a brand and not sell to Mercedes-Benz. So we have, believe it or not, Ford people to thank for the uh, extraordinary success of BMW uh, as a whole and the 3 Series as a as a make. Yeah, they always the Fords always somehow manage to come into these into these longer format podcasts cuz you know you get talking about automotive history and it's like they had their fucking fingers in so many different pies that it's you know they do they intersect instead of you know five clicks to Hitler we could do five clicks to Henry Ford and it'd probably be pretty easy actually. Yeah, they there's a lot of stuff that Ford did that helped to bring the auto industry really out of what you might call a stone age. And it's a stone age that they invented, and so a lot of their uh, a lot of their input and a lot of their advice was heeded by people, and a lot of the things that they did set the set the tone for what happened in the future. Uh, I mean, just think about it with Ford. Just think about the Shelby. I mean, nobody had really at that particular time nobody had really done a specialty car, and then after that there was an explosion of specialty cars. You know, you had the Shelbys, and then after that you had Yankos and Copo Camaros, and you had Nicky Chevrolets and Baldwin Motion Camaros. So, you know, to to look at Ford as an inspiration for things that go right in the automotive industry, there's a lot. There's a lot of uh, anecdotal uh, information there. There's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, input there from them. And BMW was the uh, 
uh, what would you say? I'd they, say the beneficiary. Yeah, definitely the beneficiary. Yeah. But they, but it was a, it was really a, a kick in the butt to get them to move forward instead of selling out. And they did in spectacular fashion, obviously, with that 2002. Very, very solid car. Nice to drive. If you can find a good one, they're kind of worth a lot of money now. Yeah, they have they have an extraordinary fan base, the 2002s. And uh, one of their biggest fans was a gentleman by the name of David E. Davis, who was the editor. I believe he was the editor at the time of a car magazine called Car and Driver, which was, in its day extraordinarily influential in in the uh, in the automotive uh, industry really because they they previewed cars they were the critics and uh, this particular uh, editor was uh, a, he stood head and shoulders above the rest as far as his opinion mattering to people the things that he said and, and the things that he liked he was able to uh, communicate that to a lot of people and when he got his hands on a 2002 he gushed over how great of a car it was and really I think single-handedly put that car on the map. Oh yeah, absolutely. And if you look at the rest of the body of work for the three series, all of them are critically acclaimed. Yeah, and, and, and you go back, and you can look at really two people that had a hand in it: William Clay Ford initially keeping BMW alive and, and telling them to move forward, and saying, you know, well, you know, you'll get it done, and, and they did. And then David E. Davis saying, "Wow, okay." These things are for real. Yeah, and and he, you know, it's funny because I see these cars now, and like I said, they have they have a cult following all of their own. The two thousand twos do, and uh, it's, certain models are a little bit more sought after than others. But for the most part, they were four cylinders. There were uh, manual transmissions, which is unheard of nowadays. Thank you very much. And uh, they had good good solid suspensions. They weren't too heavy, and man, they went like a raped ape. And people loved them when they got their hands on them, and it really. I really believe that, that car might be single-handedly, uh, uh, single-handedly, what's the term I want to use? Uh, it's probably the most important BMW ever made. Well, yeah, it single-handedly saved that company is what I was trying to yeah. say. It's, I think it saved them, pulled them out of the doldrums. They were they were building some really nice stuff, but it was all kind of it was niche really stuff. really expensive, Expensive, too. niche stuff. 508. And this, and, uh, yeah, you know, and the, and the three, uh, the six series that yeah. they had, the CLS, and that, you know, was kind of a, a connoisseur's car. And this... This said, hey, we're going to let the world in on this one. This one this one is something that a lot of people could afford to get their hands on, and they're going to have a blast driving the fucking thing. And it, it was killer. It was Absolutely. killer. And it, and it put them on the right track. And really, I think, honestly, they've been on the right track for quite a while with the 3 Series. I think that they kind of went a little off the rails with a couple of the models, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah, absolutely. So we talked about the basis for the 3 Series, you know, a sporty sedan that you can just use, you know, it's it's not a roadster, it's not a cabrio, it's just a car that's awesome to drive. And in so doing, you know, they created this segment of the, the compact executive car, and if you look at the German makes, this is the absolute fucking battlefield for Mercedes-Benz, Audi, and BMW, are these compact executive cars, the, the A4 and the 100s and 1000 Audis and the C-Class Mercedes and the 3 Series. They have been duking it out for the better part of a quarter, well, actually almost 40 years now. And uh, they've continually had to up the game on each other, and it's produced some awesome cars. So we're actually going to start talking about the first generation 3 Series right now, the E21. Ran from 1975 to 1983. And this is actually the one that I have the least experience with. I don't know hardly anything about the E20. Yeah, same here. I, I know, I you know, working at a dealer like I do, I don't see them. They do not come in. They have never come in. So people who have them, if they if they have them, they're fixing them themselves. And they, pro they probably are enjoying a lot of success because they're not too difficult. I mean, you know, as far as layout and, uh, you know, the mechanics of it, it's all real super conventional but it just freaking works, you know? And this was, the, the e, what did you say was the E21? E21. Then this was after the 2002, it's, yep. so it kind of bears a striking resemblance to it, to the 2002, but, uh, or would you say that it's not right? No, it looks more like an E30. It looks more like an E30? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, that's right, that's right, yeah. okay. Yeah, so, and this, this particular style of car, the E21, is uh, well-loved, in later versions and when it gets to a, a, a the next generation they made it look even better 
and it has even more fans, if you can believe that. Yeah, pretty much. The E21, though, what's interesting about that is it really, it was the last carbureted car that BMW ever made. Oh, was it really? It really, yeah. Yeah, because I know uh, fuel injection didn't really show up in a lot of domestics. Yeah. For, well, it was it was it later in the 80s. Yeah. And even then, it was... It was a batch fire thing, which is just like flushing a toilet and hoping that it goes into the right port, and then eventually it became sequential. But that was a, you know, that was a thing that it was like, oh, you know, it, it works a lot better. Well, we'll get to that, you know. But th- they went right to it. I, I remember I worked on those a little bit and some of the E thirties, the K Jetronics and yeah. and uh, and that that setup. And this is, you know, honestly, this is, these are the same people who put fuel injection on Messerschmitt one hundred nines, you know. So uh, they had some experience. They knew it worked. They had some experience with it. They were they were putting fuel injection on fighter planes, and then when they would get in a dogfight with the Hawker Hurricanes and the British and the uh, Supermarine Spitfires, they would turn them upside down, and those those planes would stall. I mean, the engines would actually physically stall, and not run, and the Messerschmitts would keep going, and so they could. You know, that's what they used to do. The Germans figured that out pretty quickly, that if they just roll with them, they're like, uh-oh, <laughs> somebody's plane shut off. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, not so good. Yeah, that was a, it was a good setup, and uh, solid as a rock. There, you know, you don't hear anybody say, oh, no, it was junk. It was always it was always good, stone reliable. The only thing that's sort of uh, weird about the E21 is it was actually in a transitional phase from electric fuel injection, or uh, from carbureted, engines to electronic fuel injection and for a while you could actually get them with mechanical fuel injection yeah that was always a problem with those especially if you wanted to do something sequential is you needed to know when the valves were open on that particular cylinder so you're throwing fuel actually into that cylinder not the one next to it where the valves are going to open up a millisecond later and then you know you'd have a rich and a mean kind of a rich and a lean let me try that again rich and a lean kind of a thing happening in two cylinders that are right next to each other because you can't time the ignition correctly and uh that was that was kind of a problem in the 70s and, and in the 80s well engine computers kind of helped with that so uh that was that was one of the things that went on in the 80s is you know government stepped in and said oh you gotta have a computer gotta have a computer to tell the engine to run clean like why don't i just tell it to run clean well you don't speak digital so you don't speak binary code i, I don't speak in ones and zeros you know so. Yeah, the the only really other really notable thing about the E21 is that uh, you could get it in a Bauer configuration. You're going to have to fill me in on that one. I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, for real? You don't know what this is? No. So it was, a, it was like a coach. I want to say a coach building company, but that's not actually right in Germany. And basically what they did was they took the E21 and turned it into a Targa convertible, like a Porsche. Oh, yeah, that was a big thing in the late 70s because a lot of manufacturers just said convertibles. Yeah, not going to do it. Yeah. If you want a convertible, we'll send it down the road and have somebody saws all the roof off and build you some sort of convertible top of some sort. And Yeah, those and are I, I don't super imagine, saw Yeah, I don't imagine they were real great. <laughs> no, nah, they only they only made about 4,000 of them, according oh, to this. Oh, and that's even more than I thought they would have. But that was over the course of like eight years or something, seven, eight years. Yeah, like four. Four years, yeah. Yeah, 78 to 81. Probably highly sought after. Yep. Okay. Definitely highly sought after. And uh, some of the later ones also came with uh, six cylinders, which was kind of new for them. Yeah. Or No, actually, that was old. The four-cylinder was their first four-cylinder since before the war. And actually, I got a great little anecdote about that coming up in our next segment. But So that's it. You know, the E21 sort of sets up the 3 Series as a stalwart sports coupe Yeah. for everyone. So when was that? When, when did that car, that model of car, ran to what? 81? 83. 80, oh, excuse me, eighty three. Okay. And if you're familiar with the the automotive industry in 1983, it was in a real kind of an unusual transition period because the government was really the government of the United States anyway. I'm not sure if any other governments were this uh, hands on with the car manufacturing going on uh, and the car sales in their country, but uh, there was a lot of emissions control. Let's just call it what it is, horseshit going on with all of the manufacturers. And in order to bring any car into the United States, BMW, you know, Benz, Audi, or even a Toyota or a Honda, had to have specific emissions control equipment that normally they didn't have back in their home country. And it was it was a mess. It was a real mess. That early shit 
didn't work, doesn't even matter what kind of car it was. It could have been a Buick or a Ford or a Dodge or a BMW or even a Toyota. That, that shit was a mess. And it took a long time to straighten that shit out. And I think a lot of people suffered at the hands of the manufacturers and what they had to do to meet government regulations. And, and we always blamed the manufacturer when it really, honest to God, wasn't their fucking fault. It was our government, you know, telling them how to build cars. And guess what? They don't know shit to begin with. So I can't think of they're probably the last people on earth who should be telling anybody how to build anything. So before the E21 was even really out the door, they had already started designing the second generation of the 3 Series. Well, yeah, that's always the way it works. <laughs> and in July of 1976, styling began for the E30. That early? Yeah, that wow. early. They, they worked on this for quite a while. And you know what? They got it right. Well, it does show, I mean... Uh, you know, out of all the cars out there that have a, re- a real honest God cult following, and some cars have an extraordinary cult following, uh, there's not many that match the E30 BMW. There's not many at all. No, absolutely not. These these folks are, they're insane, really. I, I You know, I mean, I mean that in a good way. I don't mean in a, you know, jacket with extra long sleeves kind of a way, but they're really crazy about those cars. They love them. They, and... I mean, how many does uh, your friend have? Oh, Dan? I mean, yeah, he's got... Shout many? out to Dan Neal right now. Yeah, he's there you go. Got, uh, I know he's got three, three. and then I want to say he's got eight for parts. One of which was yours? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, there's a sore spot. Sorry about a l- that. A little bit. That... And then I got another friend of mine, Frankie, who's getting a shout out, who's got uh, who's got a, a really nice black I'm not sure what year it is I think 87 I, he'll get mad that I don't know the year but uh, came with uh, came with a, a six cylinder I believe they swapped in a uh, uh, what was it they swapped in an M30 yeah S50 oh yeah no originally they swapped originally in they M30. swapped in an M30 and, and of course in typical enough. hot rodder fashion wasn't fast enough so we swapped in and I, I could say we because I helped a little but uh, we swapped in an S54 out of an out of a newer M3 and uh, that that's a running pony. That, that thing's got balls. That dog will run. So that is, and that's, and he's got it all finished, which is unusual for project cars. But it's all finished and drivable, and it's it's sweet. It There's is no, fucking sweet. It's it's really nice. And uh, if you don't believe us, check out M Tech Uno on Instagram. Yeah, I just looked it up. Uh, oh, is he is he on there with yeah, that car? M Tech Uno. Check yeah. it out. We'll put a link in the episode description. Yeah, you know, and if you're thinking about doing that swap, you could check on on his Instagram and find some solutions to some of the stuff that he had to do to make that thing go. Cause there was a couple of crazy things that had to go on there. Oh yeah. I uh, had to have a DME uh, tuned uh, without the EWS and all that horse shit. And then he uh, had some, he had some headers made uh, or he bought, I, I think he had them made. And then he had them wrapped. Then he, he had yeah. them ceramic coated. And then uh, there was a, a few things that needed to be uh, fabricated. And then uh, of course he, uh, you know, to get that thing in there with that great big plenum that those things have on there, he had to ditch the power brakes, so he's running all manual brakes on there. But uh, he's got a setup that works really well, and it's a it's a sweet sweet ride, and uh, and a lot of a lot of people really fawn over that at the car shows and at the at the cruisings that he goes to, and just goes to just goes to show you the popularity. I mean, why are you so popular? You know, seriously, everybody loves that. No. Everybody loves those cars. I mean, I I'm a fan of them. I'm a fan of them. I worked on them quite a bit. The one that you had, I did a heck of a lot of work to it. Was able to get and there, and you know, you you'd be surprised in a car that really hasn't been manufactured for over 25 years now. There's still an extraordinary amount of parts support, which is very helpful when you're trying to put something like that together. You know, if you can go up to the BMW dealer and say, hey, I need this for this. And they go, yeah, we can get that. You know, I mean, it might have to come from Germany, but they can get it. That, that stuff's available. And it's a big deal. Oh, totally. Because... It makes life easier. Yeah, it makes life easier. And it's, uh, it's it, it you know, it's a little... Uh, obviously, a BMW parts from a BMW dealer are expensive. Like, why do you cost so much? But uh, they, they have them. You know, if you got to have them and, and you can't go anywhere without them, then expenses really no, it's not not the main thing that you're worried about in that situation, you know? Well, and compared to 2002s and E21s, I mean, junkyards are practically overflowing with E30s compared to those two models. Well, it depends on where you look, too. But, I mean, in the north where we are right now, yeah, not so much. They get slightly obliterated up here. Yeah, they... they 
they got eaten away by salt like a lot of cars did. And so it's, you know, it, it's tough to find nice, usable shells and, and, and car bodies up here for anything. Uh, yeah. Beside, and, you know, E30s included. You know, I mean, it's not it's not uncommon to go and look at one and the owner will tell you, oh, it's mint. And then you pull back the carpet and it's got holes the size of your head in the floor, you know. The one good thing about, though, the E30 is you could get it in a lot more variants than you could ever get the 2002 and the E21. You can get it in two-door, four-door, convertible, and touring. And this is sort of the beginning of BMW starting to stretch that entry market sort of point of sale that is the 3 Series into, you know, let's make it for families. Let's make it for you know, people who want to go adventuring. Let's make it for people who like convertibles. Let's make it wunderbar for everyone. Yeah, the uh, the E30 Touring, and in BMW speak, Touring means station wagon. Uh, they didn't have that here in the United States, and it's an unfortunate thing because that thing is cool. It is fun. And I'm cool. really not one of these wagon guys. I know you're all cringing out there going, oh, he's a station wagon guy. Oh, he probably has a, you know, he probably has a Volvo 240 yeah, with a small block at home it. and, you know, he throws his dog in the back and he's got skis on the roof and shit. Nope, that's me. No, that, with my that's, E53. That, that's you, but that's not me. So, yeah, I'm, I've had a wagon. I had an old Vista Cruiser Olds wagon and that was fucking cool as shit because I could fill it full of beer, my beer drinking buddies. But uh, I... I'm not a big wagon guy, but the E30 Touring is uh, is a pretty funky looking piece of equipment. And if you brought one of them over here, you'd have to beat people away from it with a stick, including Dan it, Neal. Yeah, it, because <laughs> because they would want to buy it and they would want to stick an S54 in it or maybe even an S62, which would be insane. But it could be done. I'm sure. I'm sure somebody. <laughs> I'm sure somebody somewhere in Europe has done it. And if they've got pictures, that. Please, please post send them. them. Yeah, please. <laughs> I want to see what you did with the shock towers, for Christ's sakes. I know those things are a little wider than a S54. So, but uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it, it it would be a crazy thing to bring one of those. I, I think there's a, probably about a half a dozen or so. No, in the there's United States. there's a couple. It, there's there's a few. They're in the out States. there, and they yeah. are stupid money. Yeah, well, of course they're stupid money. But you know, you think about what you got to do. I mean, it's got to take a boat ride, and you got to pay for it. Or maybe if you're in the armed forces, you can get the you can get the army or the navy to pay for bringing it over here. But for the most part, it, they they are not a lot of them over here. They were fairly common in Europe, I'm sure, but. Yeah, here, not, not mm, super common, but more common than you'd think. Yeah, yeah. And then they also had a four-wheel drive, an yes. XI, which was their first foray into that. And and that makes a, that makes the car really unusual. There's a lot of, because we've had them. I've worked on them before. We've oh, they're had, fantastic. We've had some at the Indy I was at. And they have, uh, they have some unusual things that they did with the engine and the transmission. And, of course, the transfer case. I mean, it's a conventional layout, but everything's moved just like a little bit. Yeah, and the oil pan has to be a little bit different, and it's just, it's just oddball enough that if you try to take, I don't know, say the motor out of it and put another motor, in, you got to do some stuff to it to get it yeah. to go in there. There's, there's a there's a little bit of tomfoolery that went into making that car into four wheel drive, and and uh, but you know, and I, I've known a couple of people who owned them and they loved them. Oh yeah, they're but that's just pretty typical of anybody who owns an E30. They just love it's them. a cult, but it's it's the best type of cult. And actually, you know, I <laughs> you say that, but there's kids out there who are rolling pennies to try to buy like spoilers for them. Yes, it's, I know it's and, ruining the economy of their family. And actually, we're <laughs> let's get to that next. Actually, the no. E30 tax. What? It's nuts. It's bullshit. Well, it's nuts, but I mean, I bought yours. It was like six hundred bucks, and it was effed. Up. Oh yeah. Tranny didn't work right. The rear, the rear subframe was all jerked around and egg holed where the control arms bolted to it. And I spent a lot of time and energy putting that car together, and it still was. I know you loved it, and, and you guys drove the piss out of it. Oh yeah. But it was still kind of a pile of shit <laughs> when I was done with it. I mean, I did a lot of work to it, but still, I couldn't, I couldn't get the uh, get the old car out of it. You know, the the the, the feeling that it a little bit rickety you know i that's that's just my opinion i mean to me it wasn't it wasn't really solidly put together the way you guys had it you know i mean it i'm not your, gonna disagree with that actually no i mean if you, if you drive something new and then you drove yeah. that car you'd be like holy wow shit, what the like, fuck's wrong with it's that? like driving a marble down the road it's like whoa <laughs> man i gotta steer it all over the fucking place and i mean i didn't you know there's some things that i didn't do there was some parts that did not technically need to be replaced probably could have been because they were worn out but you know i just 
I did what I could do to get it going so that you could drive it to school. And, and then lo and behold, everyone in your family drove it. I think you never shut it off at one at any point in time. And no. What you end up putting on it was like, we figured it out with like 40,000 miles in one year. Yeah, in one year. One year. And one by the time, time that... And it, you, you almost have to have the car running constantly. Yeah. By the that. time that that car, you know, finally breathes its last, uh, rest in peace, Felix, wherever you are. I know part of the... I know the engine's in a buddy of mine's car. The subframe's in another buddy of mine's car. The seat's in another buddy of mine's car. Really? Uh, dude, that car was an organ donor. Wow, like, okay. That yeah, car I, saved a lot I of lives. I believe that even some of those parts went into Frankie's car, the, yeah. the S54 swapped car. I, yeah. I don't know exactly what, but I know when people called up Dan Neal, he looked over at that car, that Luxor beige E32 door, and said, oh, yeah, I got one of those, you know? Yeah. And, and there it was, you know? So, I mean, as a, as a corpse... As a cadaver, it was probably more popular, and more profitable than it was as, as a running, driving automobile. Well, I, I gotta be honest, those, I really love that car. I, I know. I, I want know, one. It's, it's I want fine. another one I, bad. I, I, I understand the affection. I mean, we've already done the Oldsmobile brand, and yeah. that was that's where my affections lie. So I, you know, I can't sit here and say to you, "Oh, that car was a piece of shit." Why'd you even like it? Like, I get it. Yeah. I get it. I'm not going to deny it. And you know, as listeners out there, you know, you guys have passion for. All kinds of different shit. And I mean, every kind of car out there really has a... Every kind of car out there has a Facebook page. Every kind of car out there has a following. There's a club for every fucking car ever built, swear to God. And and they all know, like, the most... Minute, Intricate, minute details. Yeah, I yeah. mean, the, the, the minutia that you guys know about these Crazy. cars is ridiculous, you know? And, uh, we, you know, if you, really, honestly, if you have a car that you're a fan of that you like and that you love and that you have friends that love as well, you know, hit us up with a little bit of uh, input on Facebook. Maybe we'll dive into what makes your car special, not just to you, but to everybody and why they should be special to more people, really. I mean, the, the passion that we have for automobiles overall is ridiculous. I mean, we have to, you know, we have to work on them. And if we don't like them, we don't want to work on them. So we, we kind of have to have a passion for everything as technicians, especially, 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 I want to say this one more time. Especially if you work in an indie, if you work in an independent, you better bring a satchel full of passion because you're going to be working on a fucking Chevy Impala one minute and a fucking Alfa Romeo the next minute, and turn around and have a Maserati in the bay behind you, and maybe a Ford Transit van that needs an engine, or you know, I mean, really, the variety is just mind numbing, and so you you have to have a you have to have a lot of passion and a lot of technical experience to do that. And I got to tell you, uh, you know, I know we're talking about BMWs here, but if you're working in an Indy and you're working on everything basically uh hats off to you you indie guys i think are probably way fucking smarter than us uh dealer hacks because all we have to do is get used to one or two models and we know what after a while we know what they're doing you know the people call us up say my car is doing this yeah we know (laughs) but you guys you got every day is a fucking adventure Every time you open the toolbox, you go, oh, I hope I have that wrench. And you look in there and, no, you don't have it. So now you got to make it. So, you know, being being an indie guy, there's there's a lot of passion that has to go along with that. And let us know what you personally like, okay? Don't, you know... You know, maybe maybe somebody you know likes a car. And you don't, no, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear what you like. Tell us what you like. And, you know, if we can get enough people telling us that, hey, you know, we like, uh, you know, let's pick something goofy like a Pontiac Aztec. We'll do a piece on it. I don't care. I mean, do you care? No, I, mean, I don't I, care. You know, the Pontiac Aztec was really kind of a, a crazy good automobile that just looked goofy. And people just said, oh, we have to find the ugliest car in the world. And they threw a dart at a at a at a map of all the cars and it hit Pontiac Aztec and they said, oh, let's pick on that piece of shit. It was a pretty good <laughs> shot though. Well, but, it, but it's it, a fantastic car. But it, let's yeah, let's it, get back yeah, to we'll, BMW. We'll get back to we'll get back to BMW. <laughs> but I just wanna I wanna instill, I wanna work up the passion that you guys have and, and and then let you know that that's what we're talking about here when we talk about the E30. That passion is real, it's substantial, it causes those cars to exchange hands at prices that would probably make you wanna throw up. I mean, oh yeah. The, the popularity of them is just is. I mean, I see it. I see it in the guys I work with. I have two guys that I work with that just graduated from the uh, manufacturer's training program and are working at our dealership less than six months. Yeah, give them a fucking shout out, eh? Both of them have. Well, I got Dan and I got Angel, and they both uh, they both have E30s. And if I'm not mistaken, they both drove them from Austin, Texas, to. Uh, uh, Woodcliffe Lake, New Jersey, to go to school for six months 
to learn about BMWs. Jesus. And I mean, this is some hardcore shit that's going on there. That's these, a long drive at these guys, thirty. And no, seriously, I think one of them towed theirs. I don't know. I, I said something to him about it, and he said, "Oh, we towed mine," but uh, he had it there with him. And, and you know that that's the thing that these guys bring to the table as mechanics in our shop. They have the passion for the brand, and you know you can't beat that shit. If you got a guy in your shop who has a passion for the brand he's working on then he probably goes home and pinches himself and goes, man, I can't believe I'm working there. That's so cool. You know, obviously there's days when it sucks. We all know that. You know, as technicians, we're like, oh my God, I don't want to see another fucking car for the rest of my life. And then, you know, you have a long weekend and you drink a bunch of PBRs and you come back in on Monday and you got a fresh start. And you, you're like, all right, all right. I, I make pretty good money doing this. So let's let's keep it up. But the, the I mean, I I can't stress enough the, the cult-like status that the BMW E30 has. It's ridiculous. And you talk to those guys that have that kind of, you know, the glazed over look that the Manson women used to have. <laughs> <laughs> they they will tell you stuff about the car. Oh, it's a E it's a it's a 325, but it's an Etta. And you're like, well, what the fuck's an Etta? Well, the camshaft timing's a little bit different, and and the and the tack only goes here to this far, and and it, and it does this, and it does that. And it's like it was supposed that, to get better gas mileage, but just, it really didn't. Well, I mean, you know, with me driving, you're just dropping, yeah. you're just dropping the cam timing back a little bit, and you know, you've, your rev limited a little lower. It's, you know, it, but but this is not the most highly sought after one. You know, you want the IS and not the E. And I'm like, oh well, you know, I could. I could just glue an, e, an IS onto it, cut, chop off the E, and there you go. You know, it's worth thousands more or something. But, but yeah, the E30 was uh, was is just, I can't even stress it enough. I've said it a thousand times already here, but I'm going to just say it one last time. They're extraordinarily popular. So let's talk about the engine that you're most likely to rip out of your E30 once you buy it. Well, there's there was four cylinders and there was six cylinders. Uh, well, and there was diesels for a little bit. Mostly get the fuck Europe out of here, really? Yeah. Diesels? Yeah, you can get a turbo diesel. Well, in Europe, obviously, not yeah. here. Yeah, because they had they had uh, turbo diesel five series cars here, and they were basically smoke machines. Yeah, pretty much. They were, they were terrible. <laughs> I had an instructor at uh, the the manufacturer's school that I went to that had one, and he was late for work one day, and it turned out that his car caught on fire. Oh, yeah, it burned up. It was a it was a five twenty four TD with it because you know TD is a diesel in German yep. speak, so. Yeah, and it was it was god awful. I mean, the whole black, the whole back of it was black. I mean, we're talking back and black, baby, big time. I mean, it was it just spewed soot. It was terrible. It yeah. was terrible. I mean, you you couldn't even work on the car without looking like Al Jolson after a while. Oh, you know, it was bad news. Oh no, it was terrible. So for them to stick that in the E30, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it obviously didn't make it to the U.S. because I. Or did it make it to the U.S.? I mean, you're looking at me. You like, can I don't you know. can get them there. You can get them here now, but. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, but yeah. they were originally just a Euro only thing, right? Uh, yes. According yeah. to this, yeah, because in, in Europe, I think they don't give a fuck about emissions because everything blows over to Russia and nobody gives a fuck about Russia. So, <laughs> hot take on political science. With yeah, well, you know, I mean, I'm not living there, so I don't care if my garbage or my snow or my emissions go to Russia, whatever, you know. <laughs> But let's talk about the M10 for just a hot second here. The M10 was the four-cylinder. It was the four-cylinder that remained in production for 26 years. Yeah, it's kind of a long time. I mean, small block Chevy was in production for a long time, but uh, yeah, it's a little different story. A lot of different story. A lot so of different narrative. <laughs> if you got an E30 with an M10, odds are you have 15 plans and probably three or four mock-ups and a whole bunch of bookmarks on your internet about how to rip it out and put in something way fucking better. But the M10 actually has one incredible distinction. They turned it into a fucking Formula One engine. In the in the 80s, uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, there was the first turbocharging era in Formula One. And Brabham, uh, Formula One, founded by... Jack Brabham, decided that they were going to go with a four-cylinder with one humongous turbocharger on it for their Formula One car. Yeah, picture your F-250 Super Duty turbo. <laughs> or like a basketball. <laughs> I mean, seriously, these things were ridiculous. And because they went with the four-cylinder instead of like the Ferrari and Renault V6s, they could make their car more narrow. And because it was more narrow, it cut through the air faster. And because it cut through the air faster in places like Monza 
and Spa and, you know, all the great old European racetracks, the Hockenheim ring. This motherfucking engine murdered people. And the original engine made like 75 horsepower. It's a cast iron block. There's nothing special about it, but you put it into the hands of these guys and it made 1,400 horsepower. It ran at like five bar. <laughs> Seriously, five bar into an M10. Obviously with some significantly upgraded internals. Let me let me do a little bit of math for you if you want, folks. Because uh, our listeners, if they're in the United States, they're familiar not with the metric system, but with a st- standard pounds per square inch. Uh, a one bar equals up almost 15 psi. So what you're talking about here is, what is that? 75 psi. Yeah. On your on your turbo. Yeah. That's a lot of squeeze, bro. That's a lot of squeeze. That's a lot of squeeze. And actually, it allowed Nelson PK to win the Formula One Drivers Championship in uh, I believe 1983. And it came from a shitty BMW four cylinder engine that we all throw out. Yeah, I, I, we do. We throw them out. We don't want them. But, dude, that's serious horsepower. Well, and, you know, and kids these days, you know, and I, I say kids because everybody's younger than me, and I'm not doing this so. But they, they're hanging them great big fat fucking hair dryers on their fucking cars. But, I, uh, you must, they must have done some shit to them because they're not getting fourteen hundred out of an eBay turbo kit. No, nobody's doing that. <laughs> nobody's doing that. You might get a couple hundred horsepower, and that even that's. You know, scary. Pretty, that's a pretty good value. You know, if you spend five, six, seven hundred dollars on an eBay turbo kit, you slap it on, you're getting a hundred, hundred and fifty horse. That's that's a pretty good horsepower per dollar value. But uh, fourteen hundred out of a four cylinder. I mean, think about how much power each cylinder has to make. I mean, divide yeah. that old mess by four, and you got over three hundred horse per cylinder. Yeah. How's that even possible? They must have had a, like a twelve to one squeeze, and then they're squeezing the intake charge before it even gets in there, and then they're lighting it off with a. Who, who do you got to light it off with? I mean, really, you know, it's like, yeah. I, I mean, why do you keep plugs in the fucking? I have <laughs> no idea, but dude, in qualifying trim, they could crank it up to fourteen hundred horsepower. In race trim, it was right around a thousand. But obviously, qualifying but you want if more. If you got juice. a little tiny car that you've made real narrow and and you've you've trimmed out all the fat, and you've got a thousand horse, and the car only weighs twelve hundred pounds, that's that's some power. quite the horsepower <laughs> to weight ratio there, which is the name of the game when you're racing, you know. It's like uh, they'll tell you. Anybody will tell you. Anybody who has even a remote, a remote knowledge of physics, say, "Hey, lowering the weight's exactly the same as raising the horsepower. When the horsepower is already high, guess what? You're gonna go faster." And actually, this M10 was also the basis for another phenomenal racing motor. So the Formula One variant was called the M11 and M12, but it was also the basic formation for one of BMW's own race motors, the S14. And the S14, as we all know, in E30 land, was the engine of the very first BMW M3. Man, you, you, you might think, and if you run into this, you would say, oh, you know, E30 people are kind of crazy and, and they're out there. But then you run into the uh, people who are fans of the sacred E30 M3. And I, I mean sacred. I mean, these things are sought after like the holy grail. And you, you don't see them anywhere. And they are they are very specific and very specialty built car. I mean, the quarters and the fenders are different. I think yep. the doors are the same. I think that's but, about uh, I think it. the doors are the same, but that might be it. And they but they I tell you, out of the box, these things fucking ran. Yeah. They were goers. And uh what did they even do to the engines? They weren't they weren't uh, they were naturally aspirated, weren't they? Yep, yep. They but just, they were yeah, they just they were on the hairy edge rev. of being naturally <laughs> naturally uh aspirated. They 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 fucking screamed. They were screamers. Absolutely, yeah. They were high revving little units. And actually this uh this takes us rather conveniently into the German touring car racing, which BMW kicked the shit out of people with the two thousand and two turbo. But they really kicked the shit out of people with the first M3. They had a winner. They yeah. had a winner. Yeah. And people that people that have them, they cherish them. They there's, you know, the cult like the, the cult like uh, uh, desire for the M3 is is out there in the stratosphere. I mean, you know, they have they have the regular E30s. People love those, but this was this was over the top. This was serious infatuation. 
and and even even one and the prices reflect it because it's you know it's it's part of the whole e30 tax thing the prices i mean you can find one that's got you know this missing and that missing and 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 it's it's basically a shell and it's still eight thousand fucking dollars it's like really are you kidding me and then they go oh it's an m3 i'm like well, okay, it's not for me, but there are some people out there who would fork over for something like that because, you know, they need somewhere to start and they don't have anything, you know. Uh, that That's a sign of something that's that's highly sought after and highly valuable is when you, you can get one that's just about done and should be scrapped, and yet some guy's out there going, oh, I can fix that, and here's $8,000 of my hard-earned cash to drag it home and get started on it. And actually, the E30 proved to be the uh, the basis for the BMW Z1 Roadster, which I have never actually seen in person. Yeah, me neither. It's really weird. The doors don't go out; they drop down. Yeah, it is. I've it's seen pictures strange. of it. It's a very odd car. I, they probably have one at the Welt. Yeah, in probably. Munich. Uh, and, and the Welt is the uh, BMW headquarters in Munich, Germany. And uh, I'm sure Welt means something else in German. I don't know what it is. Uh, I apologize for not knowing that. But uh, it, if you wanted to buy a car, and, and this this has been going on for ages, if you wanted to buy a car from BMW, and it was one of the ones that they build in Europe, because some of them are built here, but if it was one of the ones that they build in Europe, you can actually do what they call a Euro delivery, where you go and, and you stay in a hotel, and I mean, this all you can pay for this through the dealer. You go and you uh, you you buy the car, and you you get the uh, Euro. European delivery and they fly you to Munich, Germany. They put you up in a hotel. They bring you over to this Welt, which is basically just a museum in the headquarters. And it's extraordinary. And of course, it's all glass and chrome and sanitary and spectacular all at once. And then they they give you your car and they give you uh, plates uh, that so that you're registered to drive the car on the road in Europe, not just Germany. And they give you insurance and then they send you on your way. And you can drive all over Europe, wherever you want to go, however long it takes, doesn't even really matter. I've seen some people, they do it for a few days. Some people do it for a week or two weeks. One guy I talked to did it for a month. Uh, and, yeah, that'd be me. Yeah, I would I would do it for a month because Europe is just chock full of shit I would love to see. And and who knows? I mean, I'm getting up there in age. I may not get there, but uh, I would like to, you know, that there, I mean, because the history of, uh, the history of, of human race uh, exists probably I would you know a good chunk of it exists in Europe you know I mean and there's a lot of things to see I mean France you could you could spend a month driving around that by itself Germany same thing uh, you, you can get you could bomb down to Italy and maybe even up to the to the the Nordic countries and I don't know how far east you could go or would want to go uh, and then <laughs> then you could end up in England and and you could actually drive to England through the channel they got a tunnel under the English Channel that would have been helpful in the war, but I suppose it would have been guarded pretty good. But, it would have uh, been the first thing I blew up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you would have, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but it's it's up and running now, and they do. They actually drive from from England to France in this tunnel, and uh, it happens quite often. You could, or you could take a ferry. They still do that, I'm pretty sure. And then when you're done, they put the goddamn car on a boat and they send it over to you wherever you are in America. Because they do that anyway. I mean, they were going to send it over there. It's like, why not let you drive it while you're over here for a little bit, you know? And then uh, then they send it to the dealer that's near your house and you go and you pick it up and everyone goes, wow, how was your trip? And then you, you get to bore them with your pictures on your phone and you get to show them the videos that you made and you tell them about all the stories about how you ate weird stuff in weird countries and everything was cool and... And, and it's it's really quite an experience. I, I want to do that really, really bad. I yeah, really do want to do that. And uh, I, I don't even know which what I would get, you know. I would probably I would probably get a three series just because, you know, I mean I'm not a big car guy and I, I'm a let me just let me rephrase that. I'm a big car guy, but I'm not a car guy who likes big cars. I like smaller and more medium sized cars, you know. I'm not I'm not down with the with the seven series. I'm not really down with the five series, although it's a little smaller than a seven, but the three series is more my speed, my style, and my size, and so I would probably get one of those Euro delivery. That would be cool. So the three series is your Goldilocks BMW. Well, I, yeah, you know, one's too big, one's too small, one's just right. Although it's the smallest one, so you know, it doesn't really fit. fit well, no, they, they make the one series, which is fucking. Tough. No, they don't. They, they, they don't make the one series anymore, as far as I know. Oh I think yeah, it might be two. a European thing still. Yeah, but because uh, everything's got to be smaller over there, it's this is crazy on it. And uh, as Americans, okay, let me just say to you, you got it good over here, and you don't even know it, because in Europe, you pay a tax on the size of your engine. So just imagine you were going to fire up, 
a 73 Olds 98 four-door Regency with a 455 in there, and they charge you per liter of displacement. Yeah, And that thing, the liters of displacement on a 455 is like 7.7 .7 liters, I think, somewhere in that neighborhood. Yeah. And the tax is not... It's not a small tax. No, it's not a fucking small tax. It's not low by any stretch of the imagination. And also, by the way, hello, the gasoline, which is referred to as petrol over there, is sold by the liter, which is slightly larger than a quart, and the prices for the gasoline over there would make you vomit blood because they pay a shitload of money for gas there. They always have, and they always will. And and so public transportation in Europe is a huge thing, huge. So you want you want the small stuff when you're in Europe. You want the smaller cars, and and they probably sell, you know, triple the. Uh, smaller three series cars to the larger cars in Europe. It's only in the United States where we really want the big stuff. Yeah. What's funny is they don't understand that we want why we want the big stuff here, but uh, you know, Germany could fit probably 70 or 80 times inside the continental United States. So they don't get it. You know, you could drive across Germany in 6 hours. You can't even drive across New York State in 6 fucking hours, you know. No, you're still on Long Island. Try driving across Texas in yeah. 6 hours, you're just going to get to like the, the outer edge of the middle. Yeah. <laughs> like you're not going to get anywhere at this all. This is not the beginning of you the You might end. even be in the same fucking county for all I know. <laughs> no, is it... Or, yeah, how does that Churchill quote go? It's not the it's not the beginning of the end, but it might be, in fact, perhaps the end of the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> and that's Texas. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. I think a lot of a lot of people in Europe, when they when they think about the... the or they, what do they call it? Decadent. The decadent Americans, they drive pickup trucks and great big cars that guzzle gas. They go, yeah, well, we got a long way to go and we got to bring a lot of shit with us, okay? So fuck off. You know? <laughs> we're not telling our listeners in Europe to fuck off. No, we're we not. We're not. But, you know, we it, it's a different uh, it's a different setup over here. You know, we got to, we got to, you know, it, it's not uncommon for us to, to drive three hours to go home. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, my in-laws something are that you four wouldn't hours do. away. Yeah, for, there you go. It's something that you wouldn't have to do in Germany, you know. And plus, you guys, in in Germany, they have the autobahn and they have a left lane of the autobahn, which is an unlimited speed limit. I, is it limited a little bit now, somewhat? It's limited in parts. In parts, it has to be yeah. limited. So you don't get in the left lane over there unless you're doing a buck and a half or a buck ninety. <laughs> like serious? <laughs> There's no all bets are off. And we don't have that here in this country. We have the parkway. We don't. Well, yeah, we have that. I, I was actually hauling balls down that last night, but uh, didn't you miss it? I did. Yeah. Well, I saw a lot of deer, so I was I backed, backed off. off yeah, because yeah. yeah, that's one of the problems we have here in this country. I, and I know a lot of you have problems with animals getting in the middle of the road for some reason. The road attracts them. And yeah. It's like it's like oh, I'm gonna go stand here on a yellow line. Thank hey, you, look, Russia, for coming, all your you know, and I'm just gonna stand here until it gets really close and then jump on it. Yeah, it's thank like, you, Russia, fuck. for all of your uh, dash cam videos with that. Oh That's shit, <laughs> some of them are awesome. amazing. Fuck. <laughs> I'm always worried that I'm gonna hit like an 18 point buck and then and that the antlers are gonna come through the windshield and poke me right in the fucking throat and kill me dead. And that and and you know what'll happen here in the United States? The cops will show up and go, "Wow, look at that, an 18 pointer." You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah be, oh, that guy's dead. Yeah, but <laughs> look at that brack. It's a freaking wall mounter. <laughs> wow, that one's for. Really, I'm gonna have to call Mountain Man Taxidermy on that one. Jesus. Did we just <laughs> give a shout out to Bill Anderson? That's right. Goddamn right. <laughs> Way to go, Earth. <laughs> <clears throat> this is the shout out episode. Uh, I don't if you know. can't tell. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know that's the thing, folks. When you do a podcast, it's something. If you don't realize it, if you go ahead and do a podcast, your friends will all be like, hey. I want you to give me a shout out. I want you to talk about me, or or they come up to you later and go, "Hey, were you talking about me?" Actually, speaking of shout outs, I I have a perfect segue for this, because a good friend of mine, Jordan Boberg, always refers to the E thirty six as, well, it's basically just an E thirty parts car. Yeah, well, it I, should be. I kind of can't disagree with that I, because if I had to pick my least favorite three series, this is well. It. Look, uh, when we get to the point where we're talking about the E thirty six, I might just go to the bathroom or or excuse myself because this was a car I really honest to God dislike I don't I don't like it I don't have any kind of feelings for it I think it, it it just doesn't do anything for me I didn't like working on it fortunately for me I didn't have to work on it very often uh, but I had a couple two three that gave me fits uh, there was things that they did and, and some of the interior trim was just oh, god shit. awful yeah god awful they had bad interiors 
It was terrible. But it's incredible because even though, you know, you don't like working on them and no one likes them as much as E30s, they were a Car and Drivers Magazine's 10 best every year that they were made. And that seems kind of insane to me because, you know, I mean... What does it say about the competition? I mean, seriously. It's our it, least favorite one. It, Yeah, you know, it's like they built this uh, astounding car, the E30, and then they followed it up with this... I'm just going to say turd. It really just doesn't have any kind of following whatsoever. I'm sure there's some people out there who love it. And if I'm offending you by saying I don't like it, I apologize. But I, it was it was a turd. I mean, they built... They built <laughs> Eric, they built a fucking four-door automatic M3 E36, okay? Yeah, that, that's not an M3. Get, that's, no, that, that's, <laughs> that's heresy. Yeah. That's it's not, like, it's no, not get that fucking thing out of here. If you have one of those and you love it, well, then love it by yourself and don't I don't send me any comments on let it. Us, I, let us know, because when you inevitably get rid of it, we'll take the S62. Yeah. You know, I, and give it a proper home in an E30. I don't understand what was really what was going on at the time that that prompted that. I mean, was there some sort of a backlash? You're like, oh, we want four doors, but we want to go fast. And okay, here's the car. Oh, well, we don't know how to drive a stick. Really? All right, hang on, we'll be back. And so they built an automatic four door fucking M3. It just doesn't work. And like, people, people were like, people bought them. Well, people, some people bought them, sure, because they couldn't drive a stick and they needed all the kids <laughs> around and they couldn't put a child seat in a regular M3 without folding the seat forward, which is always a pain in the balls. You'll find out in the future, by the way. But uh, it, it didn't want to have to do that. It's like, eh, you know, it's like, well, what? You know, seriously, okay, honestly, if you're going to do that, why don't you make an E36 four-door M3 Touring? Now that, that would be, be cool. fucking hot, right? Am I cool. am I wrong? Hey, go ahead and send us comments on that. If you have one or if you built one, I want to see the pics, okay? Pics or it didn't happen, okay, bros? Seriously, if you got an E36 wagon, an E36 Touring, and you stu- you you dressed it out in M3 stuff, and it could even have an automatic in it, that would that would be all right because you know it's the wife's touring. got to drive it too, right? <laughs> no, seriously, if the wife's got to drive it, it's got to be an automatic. Most 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 ladies don't want to drive a stick. I mean, there's of course I know some who do. Um, I'm, and I'm fond of them. I was taught how to drive a stick by a woman. My mom. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's my terrible. Mom, my mom taught me how to drive a stick. Where the fuck was I? I don't know. I must have been busy. Apparently. I was probably busy fixing E30s. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably. Which had an automatic in, by the way. But <laughs> yeah, well, no, a try- Luxor Beige Etta E30, if you yeah, can picture it. It's, it's awful. With, a, with an automatic yeah. <laughs> It was the best fucking car I've ever owned. <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> So, you know, we don't uh, have anything to say Eric about this. Eric is late to take his medication, so... <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just done with this PBR and I need another one. No, yeah. <laughs> he needs to excuse himself to the refrigerator. But, uh, no, that, and, and, you know, he, Eric Eric was a BMW kid. He was a BMW kid. He wanted one from, like, really, like, the beginning. I mean, I think maybe his first words were, you know, E30, you know, what's what's... Who's your Who's your favorite parent? Who's your favorite parent? E thirty, you know. <laughs> so you know, and, and having an uncle who who wrenches on him, he's like he took it upon himself to say, "All right, all right, we'll uh, we'll see what we can do," you know. And uh, yeah, I know, I know uh, you're saying. Yeah, yeah, we're well, going. It was, here. It, it was. I wish you could have all been at the birthday party because we had a little birthday party for him when he turned sixteen, and I had the car at the shop, I, and he hadn't seen it. He didn't know anything about it. Nobody knew anything about it, and I kind of. I kind of kept it to myself, and my sister and I had some pictures of it. And I mean, folks, it was kind of a wretched pile of shit. But uh, <laughs> well, I say kinda. It was it was it was something that you would drive to high school and then get rid of later, and then in your later years, you're like, wow, I had an E30 and it was cool. But no, it was it just wasn't that great. Okay, I mean, I think I paid six hundred bucks for it, and I got my I I think I got ripped off a little bit. But you know, it's it's what I do. I put cars together. But at the birthday party, he didn't know what he was getting. He didn't know what he was getting from me. And he knew I was there. And he knew that I had said that I was going to get the kids' cars when he turned 16. But really, it was kind of glossed over. It was like, oh, yeah, you know, he's not going to do that, you know. And you're like, oh, no, he will. He said he would. No, he's not going to do that. Oh, he said he would. No, he's not going to do that. But your Uncle Jimmy always comes through for you, right? Okay, so what we did is we took some pictures of it and blew them up. And then we took some pictures of some regular, really, really nice BMWs, you know, like an E65 or an X3 or a, or a, or, you know, even you just newer, posted the two worst cars, and, and even an, and even a new, and even a newer three series, you know. So we took all these pictures and we said, okay, Eric, 
I got you something for your birthday, but I want to show you some pictures. And so I'm showing them pictures. So I show them a picture of an, e and this is, you know, in front of a crowd of people that are there for a birthday party. I go, this is a picture of an E65. This is the BMW 7 Series. These are really nice cars, and at the time they were. Now said, they're steaming said, piles said, of shit. This sure. is a really, really, really nice car, and it's actually very expensive. And guess what? You're not getting one of those. So I threw it on the floor. And then, you know, just to make it, make the, you know, increase the drama of the moment. I said, this, this is an E83 X3. This is a really nice BMW. It's kind of a, a SUV thing and it's got a good, you know, it's, it's pretty good. You know, it's, they're nice. And, uh, and you know, they're, they're, they do whatever they, they do everything they're supposed to do, panoramic sunroof and four wheel drive and stuff. But you know what? You're not getting one of these. And they threw that on the floor. And they, oh, this is a new three series. This is our new three series, the E90. This is a nice car too, but you, here again, you're not getting one of them. But this picture here, this is a picture of an E30, and you can see that there's a dent, and the fender's all fucking wrinkled, and somebody painted the rocker arm with a brush, or the rocker molding with a brush, and it's got jacked up tires, and the rims are bent to shit, and it doesn't run right, and the tranny doesn't work, and uh, the subframe's all jacked up. And uh, actually, this is the one I'm gonna give you. This is what I'm giving you for your birthday. This is this is your car. And he was like, okay, cool, you know? And, yeah, I was and fucking he was, he was cool with it. And I remember that this is the dumb part. We always called the car Felix because when I gave him the keys, somebody had stamped the word Felix into the keys. So the car became Felix, so. And what's wild is, so that car became Felix. Then when a buddy of mine, Mitch, who I, there's his shout out, Mitch Ryder. Yeah. Doing good work out there in Buffalo. Yeah, the Mitchapalooza. Only, one of the only worthwhile people I know from the city of Batavia, New York. Thank you. And uh, he's like, hey, is it cool if I name my E30 Felix? And this was years and years later. Oh, and I'm really? like, And I'm like, oh, hell yeah. So there is an entire cadre of E30 owners in western New York who just car call their cars Felixes. It's like tissue. It's like Kleenex. It's yeah. actually a tissue, but... Kleenex is a brand name. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. It did. It, it sparked a whole group of people... To call their cars Felix. And you can't make that shit up, folks. <laughs> no, you're right, and I've never heard that before, so I, I apologize for doing that to you. <laughs> <laughs> but I got the car put together, and I got it working moderately well, and I dropped it off at the house, and then, of course, the radio killed the battery, so I had to go constantly recharge a battery. And, and the other thing that happened was that his father grabbed a hold of the car and started driving the absolute living shit out of it. Well, and and I I, yeah. I I can't I can't lie to you. And in case you didn't know this, that irritated the piss out of me, because it was meant for you yep. to go back and forth to school. And of course, at the time I gave it to you, you lived a lot closer to school than you did later in that yeah. year. <laughs> and so yeah, and so uh, it, it the reason for having a car and drive and wanting it to drive it to school and stuff just got totally fucking thrown out the window. So and it got pressed into s severe duty. I would I would say. Yeah, it was on the front lines for a while. It was on the it was definitely on the front lines. It needed some. Uh, it was in the A trench. Yeah, it needed some relief, and it didn't get any. So. But what ended up happening was, and this was the insult to injury part that always pissed me off, bad, and I mean bad, was my dad would drop me off at school, and he would drive me to school with a pair of skis laying between us, and I'd be like. Would it have killed you to put mine in here and we just say I went to school, but we actually went skiing? He goes, no, have a good day. And he would take it skiing, but it had posse, so he could get up those hills, no he problem. Did not really do that. Dude, I swear to How God. How many times did he do that? Five or six. Dead fucking meat. <laughs> Dead meat, that's bad. You can't do that. It was a fucking party foul, that's for sure. And I didn't want to be in school anyway. What a dick. I can't believe I never what told you What a dick! <laughs> he really did that shit to you? Yeah. He fucking stole your car, dropped you off at school, and went skiing in it? Yeah. I, how have you never heard this story? No, I never heard his story. What a <laughs> dick! That's a that's a capital D-I-C-K dick move. Holy fuck. That, oh. <laughs> we're going to take a brief technical time out yeah, here while Uncle Jimmy's here, blood I'm pressure fucking, drops. I'm going to have to go take some fucking high blood pressure medicine. That's <laughs> bullshit. If I had known that that shit was going to go on, I would have never put that car together or given it to you. Because I gave it to you. Yeah. I didn't give it to him. Yeah, no, that's why we've always been so tight. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You know, and then later on, he, fucking, ugh, Jesus. <laughs> no, because later on he gets this car. For, what do you get the car for? The, the 5 Series. You get that 
two hundred and fifty bucks. Hundred and fifty bucks. And guess who his favorite? Guess what his favorite BMW mechanic did? Oh, he took the old shit engine out and put a good one in it. And and he's he's well, he's not driving it right now, is he? No. 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 But he did Mom drive is. the wheels off of that fucking thing. Oh yeah, that he, that thing had well over two hundred k. Last time I drove it. Well, it had it had a lot of miles on it when we got it. But the car was nice. Yeah, it was nice. We put yeah. it all together for him. And, uh, I shit. do love the E39. When we eventually do the 5 Series, I, well, I yeah, loved the, mine. The, yeah, the E39 was a, was an excellent car. And I think, you know, when you look at the E39, if you squint your eyes, you can see the E30 in it. A little bit, you yeah. Can see it's the just E30 like a big it. version of but it. But that's, I mean, a lot of manufacturers do that. They, they make a car and they learn a lot just by building that car. And they go, you know... This styling cue works pretty good on this car, and these tires work pretty good, and these brakes and all this stuff. And then when they put a car together, they're like, we're going to use stuff we already know works really, really well, and we're going to package it in this particular body. And and the E39, like I said, it did the 5 Series from 97 to 2003 bears a slight resemblance to the E30. I mean, the lights and, and the, the Hoffmeister location, kink and, yeah. and, and, you know, and it's, a, it's all four-door. There was never a two-door on that Smoother, one. Smoother, though, I it, think. A lot yeah. smoother looking. Yeah, oh, just rounded and smoother, yeah. and and the M5 was a killer. It had room for a V8, so there it was. Boom. That thing's got balls. Yeah, and yeah, and you know, I mean, you put the M5 badges on the side, and it's like asking every every car thief in town <laughs> to come by your house. Yeah, come hey, and look get at, it. Look at what this guy's got. Let's see who can get it first. You know, they were they are still. Super target. sought after. They're still the target of car thieves too. <laughs> well, yeah, because you can outrun the cops at them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless you're in uh, South Carolina by the factory, because when they built the factory in Spartansburg, they uh, they gave the uh, Spartansburg Police Department a bunch of M5s, E30, oh. E34 M5s too, no less. Oh shit! Yeah, oh shit is right. I'm, I don't know whatever happened to them. I'll have to research that and see what happened to that. Oh, but, uh, that's the that's ultimate a, cop that's, car. To that's buy. a little that's a little off target, but even that car bore a lot, of, uh, quite a resemblance to the to the E30 because the E30 set the standard for what Beamers were supposed to look like for about the next 20 years. Yeah, and actually coming into the fourth generation of the 3 Series, the E46, which we've what, both spent a lot of time behind yeah, the wheels. Yeah, and, and that <laughs> car was a straight up, the E46 was a straight up departure from what everything looked like before it, I believe anyway. I mean, if you look at it's rounded more and the, the way the lights are, the headlights are in it and, and just the way the fascias sit, and the fenders and, and, the, and the curvature of the body, that particular styling cue lasted through the uh, the next generation seven. Yep. Somewhat. Okay. That car did. It bore a, a fairly remarkable resemblance to the yeah. three series, although it was a clean sheet of paper. Yeah. Some of the styling cues were borrowed from the from the three series, and then even into the five series uh, that came along later, the E60 that borrowed some of the styling cues from the E46. But the E46 was an extraordinarily popular car because the one before it was not. Yeah. I, I believe. That's just my opinion, of course. Uh, I could be wrong. I, I All you E36 fans out there, I just want to say to you, uh, if you like those cars, more power to you. And I, I can appreciate what you like about them. But if you've worked on them and been frustrated by some of the stuff on them, imagine having to work on them every day. Okay. Imagine having to take that goddamn glove box out and and not knowing that you only have to take out about six screws instead of the twenty that are in there and that you could see and and hope that it's going to come out when you take the next one out. I mean, really, there's yeah. there's a procedure just to remove the glove box that is horrendous. And and actually, when I was at uh, training, you know, the factory training that I went to for these cars. They gave us a diagram of all the screws you have to take out on an E36 glove box and all the ones you should not take out. <laughs> and there was more that you should not take out than take out. Yikes. And, if you, and if you just remove the ones that they say you take, if the thing slides right out. But if you take them all out and you pull it out, next thing you know, you have a big pile of pieces of plastic and you have to, it's kind of a, a, an erector set of a glove box. Yikes. It was a mess. That's a nightmare. But the E46 did away with that. There's six screws that hold that glove box in. Uh, they are no longer holding the glove box in on the car I have. Because, oh, yeah. Because they broke. Yeah. Well, that glove box has been out a few times. I've had to take the car apart and clean it deeply a few times. And, and that included removing the glove box, believe it or not. So, um, and it's, it's, it's hard plastic. And in the cold weather up here in the north, if you slam the glove box... They crack. It could crack, yeah, and, and it has. So you have to open it gingerly and pray it doesn't fall in your lap. 
So, but the E46 was an excellent car. They did a lot of things with it. They did a lot of great things with it, I think, personally. Yeah, they um, sort of normalized all-wheel drive and just normal Yeah, that was cars. one of the things they did. The four-wheel drive setups and the, the initial four-wheel drive setup was actually terrible. Oh, really? Uh, the old one, yeah, like like uh, like your sister drives. That particular four-wheel drive setup was not optimal, and they changed it pretty quickly to a more optimal setup, an X-Drive, uh, they called it, and it worked a lot better uh, in the 2002 model year and later. Uh, it was be- was a better setup, and because we used to have those when I was working at the dealer, we used to have a lot of those as loaners. Oh, I and when the weather was really, really bad, you go out and you grab one of those to go somewhere to get something or pick up a customer. And no matter what the weather was, man, they went. It's getting there. They yeah. went. I can remember one night. One day I was out. I say night because it's always dark around here in the winter. But I, I one day I was out with one of these cars going somewhere to pick somebody up, and there was a power wagon, big Dodge power wagon with a plow at the, at the light next to me. And I think he wanted to be in my lane. And I think he thought that he was just going to walk right by me and get into the lane I was in before I could use it. But when the light turned green, I took off like a bat out of hell, went straight, and, and that guy was just like, uh, what just happened? Because those cars <laughs> went. They worked. The four-wheel drives in those cars worked. And subsequently, it's worked very well since, which is yeah. good. Yeah. They really straightened out the kinks that they It had. was also, uh, the E46 was also the first time they really brought a uh, touring car volume in the three series to the United States. You couldn't, I mean, I, I'm imagining that there was there were E36 touring cars. I, I don't think I've ever seen one. There must have been some in Europe. I don't, yeah, I don't. I, I don't think I've ever even seen know. a picture of one. Yeah. I can't picture what it would even look like, to be honest they with you. They made a hatchback, the 318 Ti. Yeah, yeah they did a couple of different crazy, the 318 Ti, that was, I don't know what that, that was, was all about. That was, <laughs> that was a real bare bones entry level car, I for sure. Uh, yeah. My my shop foreman had one of those for several years, and he said that thing got like 50 miles to the gallon or something. I'm like, well, yeah, because it was an M40, and most of them came with a stick. Yeah, yeah, it was a stick M40. It was stripped. It was stripped. <laughs> I mean, it had power windows and it had air conditioning, but other than that, it, that didn't, was have, about it. it didn't have anything <laughs> else. But the one that he had was clean as a whistle, and probably just because somebody bought it and it was a green. It was like the. It was like some awful green color, and, and it just was like somebody bought it and said, oh, I don't want to drive that. <laughs> Why'd even buy it? I don't know. It was cheap. So. But yeah, the E46, uh, I we've all spent a lot of time behind the wheel of those. I mean, you know, we dro- you and I drove one to pick up my brother from commercial diving school in Ocala, Florida, in the middle of December, and your car had, what, 190K on it? Yeah, my, my car has seen a lot of action, and uh, the story of my car could make a very uh, wonderful short indie film that would do well at Sundance because it's just led a really unusual life, and even in my hands it has. Yeah, go for you it. Know? I mean, we, uh, we, we drove to Florida and came through the Carolinas in the middle of a snowstorm, and I have never in my life seen people more unprepared for snow than the people in the Carolinas. I mean, they had a fucking road grader on the on the highway trying to plow the snow. Yeah, it's it around and, that motherfucker. Yeah, and a, and a road grader <laughs> is probably the least effective thing for plowing snow there ever was. In the I mean, world. it's great yeah. for moving dirt and gravel <laughs> and asphalt, and who even knows? But for moving snow, it's fucking worthless. It was basically just wet. Concrete. They did not have a single snowplow. They just didn't have. It. They just didn't have them. And it's not like it doesn't snow there, but I, I get it. It doesn't snow there often. Yeah. It doesn't snow there obviously often enough to have trucks with plows on. Them. But uh, maybe maybe somebody somewhere had invested in a snowplow truck, and other people laughed at them until that fucking storm came along and fisted everybody down there. You know. And yeah, you got to picture this. It's two o'clock in the morning. I'm driving. Uncle Jimmy's riding shotgun. He just did a stint from Rochester, New York, through Washington. Yeah, we're on the south side of Washington, D.C., and we we swap over. And all of a sudden, the first snowflake comes, and I go, well, fuck me. <laughs> oh, it was the wettest, heaviest shit you've ever seen, and it just absolutely bottlenecked the 95. And it was terrible. And I don't even know where we finally came out of it. Must have been a probably before south of the border, south of that, south of the border, the actual yeah, tourist the actual trap place. there that yeah. they have, and uh, yeah, yeah, and going into Georgia, and obviously it warmed up going down through Georgia, and then once we got to Florida, it was like I had to use a pry bar on my fingers so I could get out and take a piss. 
Okay. <laughs> it was that bad. Sure can paint a picture with the words, can't you? I uh, know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean that car. That car's had an incredible, incredible run. Yeah. And it never, you know, that, that car. I mean, it's parked right out in front of the right in front of the house right now. It's it just goes. I mean, I've never done anything to it. There's there's been one repair I've had to make to that car that would be considered uh, fatal, catastrophic, or unusual or expensive. And I got it. I did it myself, obviously. But I mean, it's just it's just had regular maintenance. It has had nothing, nothing. Uh, you know, what's the term I'm looking for? It, out of the ordinary. It's had. Yeah, it's had nothing uh, out of the ordinary except for uh, the transmission had a problem at one point, and it's a common problem with the with the transmission that's in it. It's a ZF transmission, and they have a, a, a drum in it, inside of it. It's a, it's a shun shell, is the technical name for it, and it's supposed to hold the reverse clutches in it, and it's called a DG drum. It's for the D D set of clutches and the G set of clutches in that transmission, and the edge of it breaks off. And so the clutches can't be compressed together to allow reverse to engage. So you have all the forward gears you want, no problem. You want to go in reverse? Yeah, not so much. You push Not going to work. <laughs> and it's buried. It's like the last set of clutches in the transmission before the output shaft. So you got to yank out all the shit that lives in there before it. The pump, you know, all the A, B, and C clutches. And then you get to this set of D clutches. And there's that thing sitting there all broken. And you're like, fuck. And the thing works perfectly. It works. It works perfectly. Yeah. But it won't. It just every once in a while I wouldn't go in reverse. So I pulled it apart. I got a rebuild kit from ZF. Um, if you've ever rebuilt a ZF transmission, they are an extraordinarily precision piece of equipment. There, the precision is there. You can see that the tolerances are tighter than like a Turbo 350 GM tranny or something like that. Um, they sold a kit, and then I got the manual for it, and the manual uh, and the kit worked together to keep me from doing it wrong. And I took it all apart, cleaned it all up, put it all back together with new clutches, new steels. And uh, it's been working perfectly for the last 60,000 miles. So I, I must've got it right, you know, but uh, that was it. That's the only catastrophic repair I had to do to that car. And even then it kept working. Yeah. It just, you know, if you wanted to back up, you put it, instead of putting it in an R, you put it in an N and you got out and pushed it. Yeah, you know, much. It stood for R stood for Reeboks. You're gonna have to <laughs> strap on your Reeboks and push the fucking car backwards. You know, so but yeah, that car showed up in every conceivable form possible. I mean, there was a two door, there was a four door, there was a wagon, there was a convertible, there were M3s, there were M3 convertibles, uh, and actually the M3 was the first one that they offered with the uh, SMG sequential manual gearbox which yeah, absolutely I, everybody hates. Yeah, every, everybody hates that tranny and uh it, what's weird is it's just and if you know if you're familiar with it at all and a lot probably a lot of you guys that are listening to this at this particular point know about this cuz I think everybody else may have probably tuned out who knows uh, there, there there's there's a lot of BMW guys out there who love these cars there's probably some people out there going yeah I, I don't want to listen to this but uh and you can chop that off if you want yeah, it's well, fine <laughs> sorry i just i just no, do that right. i go off we're good on time but uh as far as the SMG goes it's just a regular uh, six-speed transmission, and then they slung some shit on the side of it that allows it to shift itself, which is kind of weird because uh, what's the purpose of having a manual transmission if it's going to shift itself? It's not a manual transmission anymore. It's an automatic transmission. Yeah, exactly. But uh, And, man, when they fail, holy fuck. Yeah. Bring your piggy bank, goddammit. Seriously. It. It's, yeah, I, I fixed one not too long ago. I want to say maybe two, three months ago. Where the guy had a part installed and it just fucking leaked. It said nope. And then I put fluid in it, got it to work, and gave it back to him. And then it leaked out again, and he brought it back. You didn't fix it right. No, I told you it leaked, dick. <laughs> I told you it leaked, and I filled it up, and now it's leaked empty again. And so I filled it up again and go, guess what? It works again, but Get it's a manual stop transmission again. like a normal human being. Yeah, well, you know, it was really an odd car because uh, I'll, I, I can tell you this right now: the SMG as it appeared in the E46 was almost strictly an M3 unit. Yep. But I remember and and no you know no one everyone looks at me like I'm insane, but I remember we got a car in and I PDI'd it at the dealership I was working at and it was an E46 wagon, a touring and it had an SMG on a regular M54 engine. Weird. Yes, it was weird and, and That's super I weird. I have no idea where that car went. 
I'm, sh- it's, I'm sure it's still out there somewhere. Um, but why? <laughs> why yeah, would you pay extra I can't, for that piece of shit? No, I can't. Do, well, <laughs> I did. I actually helped a guy. He was buying an M3, and and he wanted the SMG, which made him. Strange. I don't know. Pick an adjective, <laughs> but uh, he wanted he wanted an M3 with an SMG in it, so his wife could drive it. And then he made me show him how to drive it in the manual mode, and he made me show him how to drive it in the automatic mode. And uh, I think he was disgusted with it. <laughs> but because the wife could drive it, she allowed him to buy it. So there's that. Just teach your wife how to drive stick, people. It's not that hard. Yeah, well, it's not that hard. I, you know, it's it's like anything else. You don't know how to do it, and then you learn how to do it. And you're like, watch a couple of YouTube videos, buy a three hundred dollar, you know, Subaru or Honda, and yeah. just go out and fucking do it in a parking lot. Yeah, I taught my other nephew how to drive stick, and he's he's not the sh- sharpest knife in the drawer. He figured it out, you know, so. I think if he can do it, anybody can do it, really. <laughs> That's slightly harsh, but I'm going to well, leave it in there. <laughs> no, you know, if he's if he's listening, or his brother's probably listening, but, uh, you know, he he got it. Yeah. Got the hang of it. It's not that hard. It's basic, yeah. It's simple simple motor skills. Yeah. It's, it's not doing heart surgery. It's and in put fact, your left foot in. <laughs> yeah, put your left foot in. Shake it all about. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Oh, fuck. It's going off the rails. Yeah, a little bit. But the E46 was an excellent car. Now, you know, I'm going to say to you right now, okay, it wasn't without its quirks. And if you've ever worked on these, and I'm imagining that uh, probably a good chunk of you actually have worked on these, there were some things that they did that caused my wallet to swell. Okay, there was... (laughs) There were some things that broke on those cars that needed to be fixed that could be fixed so easily. And when you looked at the labor times, you grinned from ear to ear because it was like, really? They're going to pay you that much to do that? Uh, One of the things that they did, I'll give you a little brief rundown. They had a control arm arrangement with a bushing at the back. And the bushing would wear out. And early on, they wore out very quickly. Uh, They got a little bit stouter towards the end of the run, the production run for the cars. But they still wear out, I I would say, fairly quickly. And, man, you can change those motherfuckers so fast. You pull two bolts out, then the thing hangs down in the back, you put an impact hammer on them, and they're off. And then you take some, some, no shit, you take some glass cleaner, and you spray it on the the control arm, you take the new one, and you take a rubber hammer, and you give it two smacks, and it's on. And then you put the two bolts in. And I'm telling you, it takes about as long to do it as it did for me to just now tell you about it. And it pays three fucking hours. Jesus. So they're cash cows. Seriously. There's another uh, failure that that E46s and, and, oh, by the way, everything that shared that particular rear suspension style also did uh, read, i.e., the Z4 used the same rear suspension as the E46, and so did the X3. And this is uh, was apparently, I'm finding out to my chagrin, only in the north and the northeast where we have rust problems, they would break rear coil springs. And uh, they would do it on a very regular basis. Constantly. Base, constantly. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've probably changed the coil springs in my E46 because it lives up here in western New York. I probably had put six sets in it. Oh, yeah. Six I'd sets. So. At 200K, it had six different sets. And, you know, you would think, oh, wow, doesn't that upset you? And you'd be like... Nah, they're so easy to put in. And here's another job that pays three hours, an hour and a half per side. And all you got to do is pull the bolt, one bolt on each side. You pull the bolt out for the shock. The control arm comes down about three to four inches lower. You take a, a long pry bar. And, what, and it doesn't even have to be a long pry bar. It could be a torsion bar like we had at one of my dealers. It was just a big fucking old torsion bar out of an old four-wheel drive truck. And we would shove it in there and, and put it on the caliper and then put it under our shoulder, under in our armpit, pull down on it because we had leverage like big time, reach in and just pull the, pull the spring out. And sometimes you had to reach in a couple, two, three times to get all the fucking pieces out. Ooh. But then you get a new one and you put the rubber the Chiplets. rubber booties on the end of it and you spray it up with glass cleaner and you pull down on it and you put it in, boom. And here again, seriously, changing the springs took minutes. 10 Ten minutes. Ten minutes. It took longer to make sesame chicken. Okay? And <laughs> you get <laughs> you get uh, you get three hours for that repair. Jeez. So you could do two separate repairs, <clears throat> the, the control arm bushings and the rear springs and get you, paid six hours and you're out twenty five minutes. You're, yeah, you're 
at 45 maybe I'd say at the most you know and that's on top of anything else that might be wrong with it. I mean they they went through brakes like every car does the tires were always soft you know that they would have a speed rating for the tires they want for the cars for that car and it's always a really soft compound to get excellent traction out of them you know so they wear out quickly because soft tire yeah excellent traction wears out quickly it's just the trade-off yeah and uh so you know they're good for 25 30 thousand miles so the chances that you needed tires on your e46 probably pretty good changing the struts and the shocks was always easy uh the engines that they used in them, the M54 is still one of my favorite engines. Uh, had a couple of quirky things that it would do. Uh, the diesel valves on the bigger engines were always terrible. They leaked, caused mixture adaption faults. Yuck. Uh, and you had to replace it. It was always expensive, and nobody could really go, nobody could really even look at the fucking thing and go, "What does this thing do?" And I go, "Well, it changes the runners, and you don't need it, but it has to be sealed." So you would change it anyway and it was expensive jesus christ did we put one in the oh in your yeah car? no we put we put two in my car yeah and they yeah. were they were even, they were not cheap and even aftermarket units were not cheap no because you know i mean we're we're cheap guys and we don't you know obviously we're doing this podcast and putting that out there and not getting any money back from that because of the foul language what the fuck's a guy supposed to do you know but uh, <laughs> uh the other thing that it would do is uh there was a uh, oil filter housing that bolted to the side of the block and the gasket on those would leak and and man when that when that fucker was leaking you could tell damn it looked like the prince william sound baby and the exxon valdez just ran aground i mean <laughs> seriously you're putting oil down you were putting oil down and it was a simple repair i mean that that repair probably paid four hours and here again you know if you've done one or two you're you're in there for 20 30 minutes yeah and that i mean maybe maybe half maybe 45 minutes to an hour if you have to do an extensive cleanup but but that's one of the things that goes wrong with those things uh, otherwise though that car was what i'm i guess what i'm getting at here is the car is very simple to work on and it's almost fun to work on i mean you could do a valve cover gasket in half an hour not tough at all you know you could change the plugs real easy you know uh the coils, uh, in, in there was a couple different types of coils they used in those. And in some areas of the country, New York being one of them and California being the other, they had a Sule version, which uh, was a little bit different. And uh, here's a little tidbit, a little nugget for all you individuals out there who may have this particular engine, okay? Uh, the Sule engine has a metal valve cover, and it's known as an M56. And if you are familiar with the fact that you have one of these and you have an E46, uh, get a good look at what you have for mileage and age. Because according to the California Emissions Control Board, CARB, this particular car has a 150,000 mile, 15 year warranty on anything that makes a check engine light come on. Anything whether it's plugs, coils, cats, uh, cat, catalytic converters, uh, anything that makes the intake leak, you know, split intake boot, uh, which was kind of common on those as well. That, if if you roll into a dealer and you tell them you have a Sulev and you have them look at it for a check engine light and they tell you that you need to pay for components on that car, you get yourself over to the telephone and you call up BMW of North America and they'll call them back and they'll remind them that you have a fucking warranty on that shit. If you're under 15 years old, which which nowadays... The tail end of them. You are at the tail end. Yeah. You are at the very tail end. The Sioux level was a bigger deal with the uh, the E90s. Yeah, but they didn't have the same warranty. It was a little bit less... It was still... It was still good. It was still really but good. But the first the first Sioux level warranty on the E46s was excruciating. And I'm telling you, I, as I'm sitting here right now, I, I saw service advisors sell emissions control related components on those cars when they should have been covered it happened it happened a lot and i'm not you know i'm not going to point any fingers and i'm not going to say anybody's a crook or a criminal and and even the, the owners yeah. you know if, if you tell them oh you know you need this and they're like okay and you just buy it and you put it on and, and away they go and they're happy because a lot it, of them had like 100 120k on them and they're thinking ah nothing's covered under warranty yeah, anymore i mean how could you how could you have a car that has 130,000 miles on it need an emission control component of some sort maybe just spark plugs even and then think that maybe there's a warranty on them that's kind of nuts but 
it happened. It happened. So people <laughs> did, and 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 it was like like I said, the last ones of these were probably built in two thousand six. Yeah. So they're at the very end, like you said, they're at the very tail end of that particular warranty if they have under that mileage. And and you know what? I've seen a gazillion of these things because a lot of them, I still see them in the in the shop in the dealership that I work at, because a lot of them are equipped with Takata airbags. Okay. And here's a little important tidbit for you. Uh, if you have a very, very early E46, and I'm talking 1999, okay? That was when they first came out. If you have one of those, go to the National Highway Traffic Safety, uh, or is it Transportation Safety? It's I can't Traffic remember. Safety. <laughs> Anyways, NHTSA, NHTSA, they call it for short. Go to their website, it's NHTSA.com, and look up and see if your vehicle has a recall, and I'll tell you why here. Uh, the early, early, early E46, the 99s, and they were actually still making the E36 at the time. Those particular cars have a version of the Takata airbag, which is so absolutely hideously dangerous that they recommend, or they insist actually, I should say they insist that you do not drive that car for fear that a frontal collision with an airbag deployment will kill you, okay? And here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. And I may get in trouble for this one, but that's fine. Uh, I'm an old guy. I don't care that much. They do not have a fix for this yet. But they still recommend you don't drive them. So if you have one of these cars, okay, early, early, uh, late 90s. I mean, we're talking 99, a very early E46. And it has this particular recall. And it's a stop sale recall. Yeah. They don't want you to drive the car. Bring it over to the BMW dealer and tell them you're there for the recall. And they'll have to give you a loaner until they have a repair. And you'll be happy because you're not driving around in a 20-year-old shitbox. For you'll a probably driving. You'll be driving around until they find a fix for it in a brand new BMW loaner. Not so, a bad gig. And actually, I kind of went out looking for one so that I could drop it <laughs> off at the dealer and get a loaner for the next who knows even how long until they have a fix. I don't know. No idea. Yeah, I haven't heard anything no, about there's this. Nothing on, there's nothing on it. They're like, oh, a fix is coming soon. They're like, eh, we don't know what to do. It, it's almost <laughs> like... Pfft, but get those people out of the car. Seriously. You know, it's yeah. it's basically a Claymore mine sitting there in your steering wheel. And if it goes off. Four inches from your chest. <laughs> yeah. They're very, and you know, that's the thing with BMW that I have noticed over the years. They are proactive when it comes to safety equipment. They really are uh, looking out for you. It sounds, and maybe it sounds ridiculous to you. I Because I know some manufacturers and, and even something like this was showcased in the movie uh, uh, Fight Club where, uh, the character, the main character of the movie actually drove around and looked at cars that caught fire and it was loosely veiled as Ford. But they tried to determine whether or not they, and it's it's chronicled out throughout the movie actually, but they, they would try to figure out if they need to have a recall or if it's just cheaper to uh, pay off the living survivors of the people who died in these particular accidents where a component failed. And it's, it's, it's kind of mind numbing to think that something like that happened, but you know it did, right? So... But with BMW, it's not, that's not how it is. They, uh, if they sense, if there's even a spidey sense of any kind of trouble with any of their components or any of their cars, they immediately, they go after the problem, solve it. And if they don't have a solution for it, they say, get, just stop driving it, bring it in. We'll give you something to drive. Uh, they're, they're looking out for you. They don't, they don't want to kill their customers. They don't want to hurt the passengers in their cars. They want people to... They want people to know that their cars are safe, and they are, and they want people to feel safe in their cars, and when they're not, they'll fix them. I fixed, I can't tell you how many airbags I put in in the last two years. I mean, hundreds, hundreds. Uh, in fact, I see a lot, of, a lot of E46s coming in the door. You know, they haven't been to a dealer literally in, in 10, 15 years, and I'm putting airbags in them, and they need all kinds of work. You know, they've been neglected somewhat for, for many years, and sometimes we'll actually go through and give them an estimate on this stuff but uh, they're typically there for the free stuff and so they don't buy anything other than they don't they don't buy anything at all so but they get the free stuff at least their car's safe it might leak oil like crazy and it might have bald tires and bad brakes but the airbag's not going to kill them yeah i was so. going to say at least they're not driving around with a claymore anymore so the e46 series all those cars were naturally aspirated even the s54 that frankie took out of a wrecked M3 Cabrio and stuffed into his E30. That was 
all naturally aspirated. With this next generation, the E90, that starts to change. The E90 ran from 2004 to 2013 as the fifth generation of the BMW 3 Series. And again, you could get it in a wagon, a coupe, a cabrio. Uh, really, you could get it however you wanted. And uh, this is where BMW starts turbocharging shit. And in classic German fashion, the first time they try it, they overdid it a little bit. They overdid it a lot of bit. We, I, I can still remember the first time I drove one of these cars. With the, the, the it was an E90. I think it might even have been a four door, but it was known as the 335. It was the N54 twin turbo, and I can remember taking it out, and and it was, it was fast. It was very fast. And at some point in time, and there's not a lot of, you, you're not going to find a lot of material on this particular uh, instance or on this incident, or maybe, you know, if you if you want to consider a uh, conspiracy theory. But they got the cars in to the shop after that and had us do a reprogram on them for something. And they always kind of, you know, did a little subterfuge on there. Oh, you know, we need a, a reprogramming on there because the DME doesn't, it's too sensitive. Or that you know it, it senses it senses a problem with this one mechanism and it's too sensitive to that problem and it doesn't need to be that sensitive to it. And really, what we did was the programming detuned the car. It, it detuned it. It was not. It, I think a lot of customers were very unhappy about it. And but because they so, fly, they those three thirty fives absolutely. Well, they still scream. fly, but they didn't fly as much as they did before. Yeah, which spawned really, honest to God, it spawned. Uh, cottage industry yeah, sure as fuck did <laughs> um, you know the, the the 3 series the, the is it the 5th generation did you say yeah the 5th yes. generation E90. the E90 actually showed up at the dealers in 2005 it was a 2006 model um, I I gotta be honest with you it's really not my favorite 3 series but we you know we had so many of them and again here we had convertibles we had wagons we had 4 wheel drive we had 2 wheel drive we had 2 doors 4 doors and we had M3s. Which screamed. The M3, and then I'm telling you this right now as a friend of yours, okay, as your Uncle Jimmy, if you can get your hands on an E90 or an E92 or an E93 M3, okay, the E93 being the convertible, the E92 being the coupe, and the E90 being the four-door because they did a four-door again, uh, and it's not as heinous, it's not as heinous as the goddamn... Uh, E36 four door. No, I think actually this four door is very handsome. It, yeah, it's it's yeah. a much more attractive it's dignified, automobile. Dignified, almost. And uh, they didn't do an automatic on it. They still had the SMG, and then later on they came up with this dual clutch thing, which was like an SMG, only it worked. <laughs> it worked better anyway. Let's put it that way instead. Uh, but a lot of more sticks. But I'm telling you right now, as your as your favorite uncle, if you could get your hands on one of these cars, I would do so, because not. In five years, and maybe not even in ten years, but after that, these cars are going to be highly sought after because it is the only M3 so far and since probably ever. that has a V8. That has a V8, and the V8 is actually a really good piece. I mean, there's a couple of things that it does, and there's a couple of repairs that it needs, but otherwise, it's bulletproof and it's f fucking strong. And it's it, violent. It is strong. And so I'd say in the future, I'd say what you got, if you have one of these cars, it's a V8 M3, the E90, E92, E93, you, you got something that's going to appreciate in value shortly. Hold. That's, yeah. That, yeah. yeah it's hold gonna, on to it. It'll hold on to its value, but it'll appreciate. And so you should hold on to it and, and it'll be worth more later on. Uh, very few cars, very few cars are worth more money later on. Uh, muscle cars and assorted GM cars from the golden age of the muscle cars, you know, 65 to 72, they they seem to go up in value. Jaguars, uh, Ferraris, uh, Aston Sure, Martins. some stuff yeah. goes up in value. Uh, most stuff doesn't. Uh, Beamers usually don't. Uh, but this particular this particular vehicle, I think, and this is just a prediction. I could be wrong, of course. You know, I don't have a I don't have a time machine or a crystal ball or anything. But I'm predicting that in the future the V8 M3s are going to be extremely highly sought after it's extremely. got it's got all the perfect hallmarks of a car that's going to appreciate value not that many of them i mean 
comparatively. Yeah, they had a pretty good volume on them, but yeah. I, I've also seen a lot of them that have had the absolute living shit kicked out of them. I've seen a lot of them erect. Yeah. So the attrition rate is a little higher for that car. Yeah. But so little... big engine, high revving, sounds amazing, looks pretty good. I, I think the four-door version is actually better looking than the coupe, even in the M3, guys. But it, it, it has all of these things that make cars, other cars that have appreciated in value, worth more money. It's got all of the hallmarks of that. So uh, that's our hot take for, that's, yeah, that's your, for this one. That's your, <laughs> that's your Jim Cramer tip, your investment tip of the day right there. Get yourself one of these things and maybe a couple of them. Uh, I, I really think they're going to be, you know, and I, you know, it's down the road, okay? Because I'm imagining that in 1991 or 1992, if somebody said to you, "Hey, you know the the E30 M3," and go, ah, E30 M3, really? it's going to be That's worth gonna, 150. Yeah, you grand. know, it's not going to be, you know, uh, yeah. But those things are fucking they're they're, they're, they're huge of, money. They're out of control, man, and, and people money. are trading those at big money. And I think that these cars are good. I, I don't know what the volume of production was on the early M3s. Um, I don't actually. And I don't it. know what the volume of, of production is on the current, on the E90 M3. But, uh, you know, when they when they get done building them, that's it. That's the limit. That's the, 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 the ultimate supply is capped at a specific number. And because some people can't drive and think they can, this car is always going to end up in a junkyard or, or totaled and crushed and I'm parted tired. out and shit. So, you know, they might have, let's say they made 100,000 of them. Well, you know, five years, 10 years down the road, there ain't going to be 100,000 of them anymore. There's probably going to be 50,000 of them. And there may even be less than that because sometimes people yank the motors out and sell them. People do, you know, crazy shit to cars and... And uh, that's actually one of the reasons why they always depreciate so much initially when you buy them and drive them home for the first time. You can blame some of those guys in the 60s who used to take those fucking, you know, they would get a Camaro with a 327 in it and, you know, it's got six miles on it and they're in the garage sticking a fucking Crower cam in it and a fucking Offenhauser dual tunnel ram intake on it with two Holly 1850 carbs on it. And they're at the drag strip, murdering motherfuckers with it. And then they take it home because they broke it, and they put all that shit back on and take it back to the dealer and say, "Geez, it's still going under warranty." You know, <laughs> that's one of the reasons why cars depreciate instantly, instantly. That's brutal. You know, I'm sure, it's been. I'm sure that's been done. It sounds like you did it. Well, no, I, it. I've talked to people who've done it. I've had. My, I've got friends of mine. Their dads talked to. Me. Oh, I used to have this car. I go, yeah, I brought it home from the dealer. I got it. You know, I got it right from the Chevy dealer downtown, and I had it home, and I, you know, it's 16 miles on it, and there I am with a fucking camshaft in my hand, you know, sticking in a great big fat Ed Iskey cam, you know, and throwing uh, roller roller rocker arms on it, and you know, bolting on an Edelbrock intake with a fucking 4150 Holly double pumper on there, and then I go down to the racetrack and just kick ass with it, you know, and then I get up in the morning, I gotta drive it to work. You know, that happened all the time. And, and and so, you know, from from that that racing pedigree that every car has. Yeah, pretty much. You know, any car that runs can be raced, you know. It may not win, but it can be, it can be raced, you know. It can die trying, God yeah, damn it. can sure die trying, you know. I'm sure there's somewhere, <laughs> there's somebody out there somewhere who has a Hyundai that thinks it's fast or a Kia, you know. Because, I know people who have Hyundais who think they're fast. Oh, absolutely, and yeah. I, I mean, just, nah. the, the, there was a famous story from back when I used to work at auto parts stores. And I had a, a kid that worked with me, and uh, this, this kid walked in one day, and he's looking at him, and he goes, hey, how's it going? And, uh, and, uh, and we saw this kid quite often in the store, and he goes, oh, yeah, it's, it's going all right. And he didn't seem like he was as happy as he usually is. And then when he left, the, the kid who was talking to him said to me, he goes, yeah, he goes, he's got that car. I go, yeah, he, what's he drive? And he goes, he drives a Ford EXP. Ugh. Yeah, one of them little crazy four-cylinder cars. And I go, yeah. He goes, yeah. And he thinks it's fast. I go, oh, yeah, I've talked to him before. He thinks it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And, it, you know, I was just slow as fuck, you know. But apparently he was going somewhere, and the cops wanted to pull him over, so he thought he would try to outrun them in a, and it, in a 40 XP. And wow. it didn't work. And they, no. and they took him down, and they cuffed him and stuffed him and ruined his life, basically. He towed the car and... Took, dropped his girlfriend off at his at her house, took him to jail and stuff. And, uh, yeah, it was a bad deal because he thought the car was fast. And so you, <laughs> you got to be fucking careful. I mean, if you I mean, if you got a, a 707 fucking horsepower goddamn Dodge Demon, sure, you can certainly try to outrun the cops, but if you don't have any driving skills, you're just going to end up as a as a fucking casualty. Greasy you know, a casualty state. of war, you know? They have, they have ways of making you stop. 
you know they call up dodge and go hey we got this uh we got this challenger that we're chasing they go oh yeah we know that guy can you just turn his car off for me yeah, okay watch this and they kill the ignition from a remote location through a satellite and the next thing you know that dude's on the ground with handcuffs on him so yeah it you know as far as the m3 goes though that was that is an actual that's fast a bad, car. that's a badass piece of machinery <laughs> i've driven them i um, love them i love them. they have uh one of the things that they do and it's not hard to diagnose but you have to be sharp about it one of the things that they do is they have throttle actuators these two electric motors that live in the valley of the engine underneath the plenum and which makes it a little tough to get at but uh these uh, throttle motors get hot. I, I think this is why they, they fail. When they fail, the car drives like you're popping the clutch wrong. Like you don't know how to drive a stick. Huh. You'll be driving along and it'll just start chugging like you're in the wrong gear or something. <laughs> and if you're not sharp, you no, know, I'm serious. This is on the, uh, the no, V8 M3. Weird. Yeah, the V8 M3 E90s have these two throttle actuators that live in the V of the, of the V8 engine. And if you're driving the car at a slow speed, they, they have like a, a, a spot in them. I think it, the heat really affects them. And they, they will chug as if you let the clutch out in the wrong gear. And, you, and, and what I've done, I've caught myself doing this because I wasn't familiar with it right away. I push the clutch in and, and, and make sure I'm in the gear I want to be in. And I'm a little puzzled because I'm, I'm in first gear. I mean, there's no lower gear than that. And I'm, I'm letting the clutch out smoothly, but yet it bucks like I'm stupid. You know, like I don't know how to drive a stick. And then you realize that... Uh, that it's the actual throttle actuators and you know if you say something to one of the guys oh yeah those things go all the time and you, you need to change those so you know if you have an m3 that's one of the things you want to look for um and and, and if in severe cases it will set a check on your light and let you know that that's what's bad and you got to change them that there's no there's no fix for them there's no work around there's no programming or anything you just got change now, when we're talking about the 2002 or the early BMW 3 Series, you almost can't have the conversation without talking about aftermarket support. Because as much as we love them, these cars are getting up there in years. And in fact, most of the ones we really like were made during either the Carter or the Reagan or the first Bush administrations. So when it comes to getting parts for these guys, there's really only one company that we go to, and that is GutenParts.com. Working on my old E30 was our first experience with Guten Parts, and we can honestly say that we have nothing but praise for them. And that is actually saying something, because you've heard Uncle Jimmy rant about just about everything. But we all know that once you get one older Euro car, you're probably going to get another. They're basically like Lay's potato chips. You just can't have just one. And typically, this one, though, is a little bit newer and a lot more reliable than your aging 3 Series because you have to use it every day. Well, luckily for you, that same excellent Guten customer service and microscopic error rate that we have all come to know and love, they got your back for your daily as well. Whether you have an Audi, a BMW, a Minis, a Mercedes-Benz, a Porsche, a Volvo, a Saab, a Land Rover, or a Volkswagen, Guten has the parts that you need. From my plucky E30 Felix to Uncle Jimmy's twin turbocharged E90 and beyond, Guten Parts has hundreds of thousands of parts in their catalog. Now, I worked in a Wegmans in college, and we only had about 50,000 units in our store, and that was a huge pain in the ass. So how does Guten Parts keep that many parts straight for customers and not constantly be messing up orders? Well, you make it an extremely intuitive search function that lets you search by all the normal stuff like make, model, and year, but also by trim levels, which narrows the searches down even more and lets them get you the right parts. You don't have to be a professional parts guy. You just have to know your car. And if you're listening to this, odds are you probably do. And you know what? If you can't find it, shoot them an email or give them a call. They're pretty cool folks, and they're not going to ask you whether your car is an automatic or a manual when you're buying wiper blades. And how refreshing is that? I mean, really. And you know what? It's not going to take you months to get your parts because unlike a lot of those other guys, Guten Parts has a live inventory and geolocation on all of their orders. Now, what does that mean, Eric, the producer? That means that Guten can same day your parts for any order placed by 2 p.m. because they have warehouses all over the place. It's like Amazon up in here. Gutenparts.com's goal is twofold. First, to be the marketplace for quality and unique items, whether through their own production or by showcasing products from other sources. Gutenparts.com is the destination for German car owners. Second, and this one's pretty interesting because you don't really think about this with you know e-commerce companies a lot. Second, though, is to become the location for high-quality cars, whether through routine maintenance or sky's-the-limit customization. 
So if you don't turn a wrench yourself, let the service part of Guten Parts and Service get your classic running right again. That's right. This incredible e-commerce force in the automotive world actually has a brick and mortar. You can go there. They can work on your stuff, and that is very awesome. So when we put our beamers back together, whether they're an H&E 30 to our modern Euro daily drivers, we trust GutenParts.com to get us back on the road. Good part... Good cars need Guten Parts. That's their motto, and we totally agree. And that's why we put Guten Parts in our daily drivers, and that's why they are a proud sponsor of Grease the Wheels. And now, back to the show. But yeah, the uh, do you remember, and I remember you telling me this before I, I test drove one, when the three when the E ninety three series first came out, it was attached with uh, run flats, which rode like absolute lumpy dog shit. They can, yeah. Oh, they were they were bad. Well, the the original the original uh, run flats that we had were on the E ninety. That was the first car we had with the E ninety on them, and they had they were a Dunlop. It was the f- I believe it was the first tire that we had. That and everybody says, oh, they were they were done flops, Be, but these tires were terrible. Yeah, they were bad. They were terrible. We had one. We sold uh, was it was it E ninety four door. The guy had it and he had like I want to say twenty three twenty four thousand maybe thirty six thousand miles on it or not no not even that many. Uh, he he had low miles on the car. I want to say thirty six hundred. He didn't have a lot of miles on the car, and he brought the car back and those tires were scalloped worse than anything I ever saw in my life. And we didn't have any kind of warranty on tires at all. At so the he time. was fucking pissed. Because the tires were the only run flats available. And at that time, our policy was that we had to put on yeah. whatever was on it. Even though it wasn't under warranty, even though the guy was paying. Yeah. So, and and I believe these tires were about 350 bucks a piece. Oh. And they were just regular fucking 3 Series Dunlop tires. Oh. And they were so terrible. And eventually, we did actually replace a shit house of these tires because they wore out and wore so unevenly, so badly, so quickly that we just, they, they couldn't do that to their customers. It no, was, it was ter- bad. It was a terrible. bad situation. They were, they were terrible. They're still terrible. Uh, when I see Dunlops, I mean, you know, if you work at a Dunlop store, if your last name's Dunlop or if you're part of the Dunlop tire conglomerate, I apologize to you, but you need to build a better product because when I see Dunlops on a Beamer, I automatically go with it. We got to get those off of it. They're terrible tires for Beamers. They might I've be, only ever driven the run flats, and they were they were bad. Well, everybody makes run flats now, but and, and it's kind of a weird setup because normally when you want to build a performance car of any kind, one of the things you shoot for is very low unsprung, unsprung weight. weight. Yeah. Yet these fucking tires, they're weight, heavy. They shit. were <laughs> fucking heavy as a motherfucker. And here you are, that's total unsprung weight. And so, and 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 when they went bad, when they were when they got chopped. They were bad because they were so the sidewalls were so thick, so it yeah. was transmitting. It would transmit the vibrations, the, yeah. the vibrations of the tires being shitty right through the rim and into the car, and oh right my into god, your ass basically. It was terrible <laughs> right through, right into your ass. Unless you know, unless you know, if it was a front, it went into your pedals and your feet, and if it was your ass, it went into the seat. And uh, usually, all four of them were just junk. Yeah. And so this is why if you come into my dealership and you have a car that needs tires, I recommend either Michelin's or I recommend Continentals. Everything else, I don't, I don't want them on your car. I don't want them on your car. There's really, to me, there's Pirellis on some of them. Uh, I'm on the fence about Pirellis. They seem like they're okay, but I'm just, I'm not, I'm not sold on them. I'm really not sold on them. When I replace the tires on my car, my E46, I always go with Connie's. Always go with a Connie. Uh, I don't know, you know, I've, I don't think there's really any kind of a problem with Pirellis that much. They put a lot of those on the uh, bigger cars, the X3s and X5s. These are a Scorpion or a, a P0 Nero or whatever they call them. They're, they're, a, they're a pretty good tire. Uh, haven't had a lot of trouble with them, but everything else. I mean, if I see like a Goodyear's or the Dunlops or what the fuck else is out there, Yokohama's or... Hankook, that's your favorite. <sighs> Hankook. <laughs> no, actually, uh, we have a collection, or I should say Frankie has a collection of uh, tire names from tires made in China. Oh, some of them are hilarious. All of them <laughs> are hilarious. Did I tell I, you the parts company that contacted us the other day for advertising? No. Tiny Wang. 
<laughs> Tiny Wang Engine Parts. That was a freebie, uh, just in case you're listening, Tiny Wang Engine Parts, but I could not in good conscience write copy for a company called Tiny Wang Engine Parts, because it would sound like this. Oh, shit. They, uh, one of the, uh, one of the tires that I saw, this was in Texas, one of the tires I saw in a car was called, and I, I swear to God I'm not making this up, I, ha- I sent a picture to Frankie, but my phone didn't want to do it because I have one of those ancient phones that you have to crank on the side of it. Um, it was called a Mucho Macho. <laughs> that was the name of the fucking tire. I am not making that up. And and I got to be honest with you, we are connoisseurs of odd tire names. So if you have a tire that, that has just some kooky, hilarious, kooky yeah. hilarious, <laughs> obscene, funny name... Send us a picture on the Facebook page because I'm gonna I'm gonna forward them to my buddy who collects them because he he loves it. He's got he's got quite a collection. He's got probably 10, 15 different pictures of tires that are just the fucking stupidest names you ever. I can't think of any of them right now other than this mucho macho. Mucho macho sounds like you go to a Taco Bell in a really bad neighborhood at like two yeah. o'clock in the morning. Or it sounds like a crazy old Jack Black movie. Oh uh, shit! Yeah, no, there's some crazy ass fucking tire names out there, and they're all Chinese and. And we love all of them. Well, we, we you know, I got to say this. I don't love them, okay? No, no, no. We don't love uh, the tires, no. but we love the names. We love the names. It's 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 hilarious. Uh, if I see cheap, shitty tires on a BMW, I always, I always, I got to be honest with you, I feel offended. I mean, you, you went get out, judgy. You no, know, seriously, because if you go out and you're going to buy a, a 3 Series or a 5 Series or a 7 Series, and you're going to buy one of these... One, one of these cars and you're going to drive it around you're trying to tell the world hey look you know I drive a premium automobile because I'm a premium person but then you go and you put shit parts on it it's like look maintain the car okay do the right thing put the right shit on it okay so that pretty much covers the E90 which I mean honestly I really like them you're sort of on the fence about them yeah and I'm on the fence about them and I even have one but right now it's leaking coolant because it's got a rusted out hose clamp so there's some, there was some corrosion issues with this particular car but it's actually been a really decent car and I, I find that when they come into the dealership see these had a lot of these cars also had Tagata airbag recalls and so they're out of most of them are out of warranty and so they come in for for the Takata airbags and they want just the free stuff and uh, a lot of them they have uh, an engine called the N52 it was a new version of our old engine had uh, variable cam timing and variable valve lift and it's a it's a pretty rock solid engine but they have a tendency to leak engine oil uh and we would get you know same story as it was with the e46 we'd get them in and they'd be a grocery list of things wrong with them but customers just want the free stuff and you know it's not something new that happens to us but it's still it's a little irritating to you know have these people drive off in these cars when they really need these repairs that we're recommending and they either don't have the money or they don't want to come off of it to fix their car you know so there's that and that that just but that you know ladies and gentlemen if you're listening to this goes on with every car out there you know nobody wants to spend any more money on it than they have to and still have it work you know so now we're at the sixth generation the f30 f31 f34 and the f80 ran from 2011 to 2019 and uh, there was a lot of weird shit going on with this one. So you Actually, might want to buckle I, in. I think 2020 is still seeing some of these uh, F30 series derived cars. Yeah. Uh, I think that the, there's a... It's like a relative date that would be... Yeah, no, right. seriously, they uh, they have... They're still building cars that are along that same family of chassis. Yeah, and, uh, and we're going to get into that because the options that you can get on the F30, F31, F34, some of them are kind of fucking ridiculous, actually. <laughs> what they did when they brought out the F30 is they broke the 3 Series in, into two pieces. Yes. You bought an F30, you got a four-door. You bought an uh, you bought an F30, 3 Series, you got a, a, a four-door. Yes. You bought an F30, one or two, you got a four Series that was a two-door. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of kooky, and it was it's tough even for me to keep up with that shit because they 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 took it to the nth degree. There's an M4, there's an M3, uh, there's a M4 uh, Grand Touring. Yes, yeah, which I'm not a fan of. I, I you know, and I think honestly, 
I'm probably the only one who's not a fan of it. I, I know. I really you, like them. You like them. See, yeah. I'm, I just, the Grand Touring to me is, you know, I mean, you, they have a Grand Touring 4 series. Or no, Grand Coupe. The Grand Touring is a hatchback and oh, it's awful. Yeah, no, no, let me, yeah, you, you're right. Let Let's me, back let me up. rephrase yeah. that. Okay, the Grand Coupe. Grand Coupe. Is I a, up. It's a, it, what it is to me, okay, and this is why I'm a little bit not, not very big fan of it. The Grand Coupe is a pan a Porsche Panamera uh, kind of a ripoff, almost a tribute to it. It's it's they're borrowing that particular genre of auto, of car building, of car design from Porsche because the Panamera, at, quite frankly, a very popular car, just very expensive. Not a lot of people can afford it, but you could slide your ass into a, a M4 or a 4 Series Grand Grand Coupe, and and it, it's a very similar looking car. And, and, you know, it's an F30. Uh, I got to be honest with you. Uh, I'm a fan. I'm probably a big, I'm probably the biggest fan of F30s there is out there. I, I like the E46. I have one. I like the E90 a little less than that. I have one. Uh, I don't have an F30, but I like the F30. I like the looks of it. I think the styling cues are, are on the mark. Yeah, I think. I, I think that this is the best looking. Yeah, it's a good series. looking. It's a good looking car. Um, there was relatively few things wrong with it as far as being a car. I mean, it did what it was supposed to do. It didn't have any quirks with the suspension. The suspension was tried and true. A lot of it was borrowed from the E90, which also proved itself to be very reliable, very sturdy, very good. Um, and the front suspension is very similar to the E90. Uh, all that stuff's good. The brakes are good. The tires are good. All that stuff works. The body of the car itself is solid as a rock. There's no, uh, there's no structural problems with it that I'm aware of. I know that the uh, the E46, uh, some of the M3s there, they used to crack along the back. There's none of that shit going on with either the E90 or the F30. Uh, but the uh, the Grand Coupe, I'm not a fan of. I, it, some lots of people are fans of that. It's fine for them. It's just not my cup of tea. Uh, the one car I think that is generally universally disliked is the GT. Oh, yeah, it's awful. The 3 looking. Series GT. They took the this F30. amazing looking car and made it a fucking crossover. Why does every car have to have a crossover variant? This thing this thing just looks stupid as fuck. And I don't think <laughs> it was a very good uh, I, I don't think it was a very good seller because I have I don't see them very often. No, and I, well, the thing with the F30 GT is take Ava Green. Gorgeous, slender, Anglo-French actress. She was in Bond. Now stick Kim Kardashian's ass on Ava Green. Yeah. It throws the proportions off. It, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Wow, nice analogy. It did work. Nice analogy. Nice shout out to uh, Ava Green and uh, and the head Kardashian there. But uh, Ava yeah, Green, know that- if you're listening, marry me. <laughs> <laughs> Call home. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> Phone home, baby. Uh, yeah, no, the uh, the GT is, uh, and I don't, I haven't found a fan of it yet. I mean, no. there's some people obviously who bought them, and maybe along the lines of the Aztec, it's so uh, useful, yeah, that they like it because it it does what it's supposed to do, and you know, and it's unique as shit. I, I will hand you that. I mean, if you park that thing in a parking lot with a whole bunch of other fu- other fucking other fucking car, fucking cars and cars. You're not really gonna have too much trouble finding it if you forget where you parked it, or you're you're just close to where you think you parked it. You're gonna be oh, that's my car there, you know. Oh yeah, you're driving the ugly one, you know. Seriously, um, not a fan of the Grand Coupe. Definitely not a fan of the GT, but a fan of that car altogether. And the M3 version is tits. The M3 version is a screamer. It's a great car. And uh, one of the things that that we that we didn't talk about when we were talking about the E90 was when you got to the E90. You got a lot more turbocharged models, and now, okay, now that we yeah, have this F30 generation, everyone was they're turbocharged. all turbocharged. Every single vehicle that BMW makes is turbocharged. Every single one of them, whether it's a diesel, I think the only one that isn't turbocharged is the i3, without the uh, it's electric. <laughs> well, no, but isn't there a mini engine in the back of it? No, that's the i8. The i8 has a mini engine in the back. Oh, well, yeah, but it has a generator, technically. Yeah, yeah. but the i3 yeah. can, is strictly electric. Yeah. And it has an, uh, the Rex, which is the extended range version, has an, uh, an engine. Oh, and it's naturally aspirated. It's naturally aspirated. I think it's like a like a motorcycle engine almost. Yeah, it is. It? Yeah, yeah. And it, honestly, they don't run that often. I mean, I've changed the oil in them. 
because they're due. Yeah. But the oil comes out like it's brand new. Oh, that's pretty cool. It comes out like it's. I mean, it really it's clear. The, you know, and same. You know, the, I I think that they could probably skip doing maintenance to them if they wanted to. Um, the only time they really run is when the customer runs the car high voltage battery down to nil. Yeah. And then they're going to have problems. Yeah. Because they're not actually making enough power to. Well, they 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 make enough power to re to recharge the battery so it'll move, but it also what it does is it goes into a whole other mode where it tries to regen when you're braking and then the brakes feel bad. You know, I've had people come in and the high voltage battery is at like, you know, six percent. And they go, well, the brakes feel funky. I like, guess because you got to charge a battery, you dumb fuck. Yeah, seriously. You know, and then and then the other thing they do is that the twelve volt battery after a while just gives up. Yeah. And and <laughs> I've had discussions with other technicians in my shop who are working on these things along with myself, and we're like, we can't believe how many twelve volt batteries in the i threes have given up over the course of the last two three months. I mean, they just they just give up, and they have to be towed in because they can't do anything with them. Is the heat? Huh? No, they just they wear out. They're oh. old, oh. you know. Yeah, they the age, but it seems like all of them. It doesn't feel like the i three's been out for that long, though. Yeah, the first ones are. I think they're fourteens. Oh yeah, you're they're right. Due for that, re- that was when I drove one. They're they're due yeah. for a redesign here real quick. Yeah, and they've got the better battery technology now than yeah. they've had in the past, so they got longer range. So. And actually, speaking of the F thirty and electrics, this was the first. Uh, this was the first plug in Beamer that you could get. Uh, yes, you're right. The 330e. And yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, I just went I just went to lunch with uh, my buddy Steve. Shout out to my favorite service advisor of all time. He has a 330e, and I laughed my ass off when I saw it because, and it's a goofy color. It's like a gold colored. Uh, 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 it's actually a, a F30, 330e, and uh, they probably gave it to him for free. I mean, I know, They're I know him. Cars, he's, like, he's like, oh, you have a car you can't sell, I'll take it, you know. Yeah. And then they, they give him a payment of, you know, it's like twenty three cents or something. You know? <laughs> but that's his life. He, you know, certain things go his way, and certain some things don't. But that's one of the things that does go his way. It seems like. And actually, I forgot, but you could get the E ninety with a diesel engine. You could get a three thirty five D. I Talk. completely forgot about you, that. You, you forgot about that. I didn't. Those things. Fucking scream! They got torque for they days. They scream. It's the same engine as the X5, yeah. the N57T, uh, six-cylinder diesel with a turbo, and those fucking things fly. They have balls. They scream. The and you know what? Uh, there's a few things that they do that are not so good. Uh, the the uh, obviously they take a DEF, a diesel exhaust fuel, and a re- urea. To uh, clean up the uh, exhaust stream, which which works, it works. It's chemistry, so I don't, of course, don't understand it, but it works. And I have to fix them, so actually, I do understand them now that I've said that. But uh, one of the things that they do, it's just dumb. This is just dumb. But the DEF goes into a uh, uh, a hole in the bumper in the back for the active tank or for the passive tank. Excuse me, it's a passive. The passive tank is in the back. They have two. They have two tanks for the DEF. One's up front. It's called the active tank. And you fill that up in the back. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. But then there's another <laughs> one back there called the passive tank, which is a bigger tank. And they hold about five gallons of, of DEF. But to get the fluid into there, you almost have to jack the fucking car up on its side because they're sticking out perpendicular to the road. Oh. Yeah, they're, you know. And, oh, yeah, no, they're paying the balls to put DEF in. And they did fix that on Just later models. Them. But, <laughs> <laughs> so you have one of them, and you got to put DEF in it. You've got like some sort of hose arrangement that, and it, it, it like drips in like an IV or something because it. <laughs> no, I, I, you laugh, but that was a setup we had for a while, and we don't have it where I'm at now. So we'll put them on a lift and and lift up one side of the car a good couple, two, three. It looks ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. It looks like a Joey Chitwood stunt pro- performance or something's going on in the shop. But and then we can put the DEF in it, but because the X5 it doesn't it it doesn't work the same way. I mean you. The, both of the fill ports are in the engine compartment, and you just you put your funnel on them, and you just pour the shit in there, and it goes in there. But not in that, not on the goddamn E90 diesel. Jesus Christ! And then the F30 had a diesel too, but it it got two cylinders lopped off. Yeah, it's a four cylinder. It's still a very very good. Engine, I don't recall. I, I could be wrong. I'd have to check it out. I don't think they ever did a six cylinder diesel in the F30. No. Well, the four cylinder diesel was a going mofo. Yeah. Okay, it went, and the other thing it did. If you drove it like a normal person, 
it will get you an astonishing miles per gallon in the 50 range. Yeah, Beth had one. Yeah, my brother had, my brother and his wife had one, and they would routine. They told me, and, and here, here I am, right? I'm I'm the, the the master tech, and I took it to to work one time, and when I got done, I did I maybe changed the oil or something. I don't remember. And I was bringing it back to their house, and I was going down the expressway, and I reset the uh, I reset the mile per gallon indicator. And as I was driving it in cruise control at like 1,500 RPMs at like 80 miles an hour, the thing was knocking down 49 miles to the gallon. And when I got to his house, my brother said, no, there's no way. It doesn't do that. I go, yeah, it does. No. He got an argument with me about it. I said, it's right there in a the goddamn cluster, you dick. And besides, I work on them all day long. I know that they're capable of it. But he insisted, no, it doesn't get that. Then later on, he tells me, oh, we went on a trip, and we were getting 50 miles to gallon. I go, what happened to that whole fucking bullshit story you were giving me earlier? <laughs> you know? But that's him. That's the way he, you know. That's the way it is with, with some people. You tell them something, they don't believe it, and they, they won't believe it until they see it themselves. And then when they believe it, they're not going to acknowledge that you told them that that's the way it fucking was. Kind of so, irritating. Yeah. So Yeah, F30, you could get an electrified three-cylinder, six-cylinder petrol, four-cylinder diesel. Three-cylinder? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The F-30 was offered with a mini engine for a little while. Not here, it wasn't. Never saw one. Never, ever saw one. Maybe in Europe with that ridiculous engine size tax they had it, but not here. Not that I'm aware of. What was that, a B-38? Yep. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I've never seen one in one of those. And I've worked on a lot of them, so... Yeah. You'll have to check that out, because I bet you that's a European-only thing. I bet so. I think so, too, it might have, You know what, too, though? It might have been a Canadian thing. Oh, actually, get, yeah, that'd probably they get, be it. They get goofy shit up there sometimes. Yeah. They get goofy shit up there sometimes. And uh, and then they roll down into the U.S., and they want to get it fixed, and we're like, we've never seen that before. Get the fuck out of here, will yeah. you? <laughs> what do you want us to do? Take your fucking crazy-ass money with you, too. <laughs> so then we get to the sixth generation. This is the... Or wait, the seventh generation. Well, which is it, dude? <laughs> the seventh generation. The seventh generation. The G20. The G20. And this is actually where you and I are probably going to disagree the most. It's too fucking big. Well, I, I have heard a lot of different complaints about this particular car and the way it looks. I have heard them. Uh, I don't give a fuck one way or the other, really, to be honest with you, about, about the style. Some of the styling cues appear to have been borrowed from, like, Lexus. And, and the Honda Accord and maybe Toyota, I don't know. I've heard several different comments about, you know, some of the styling cues on the rear fascia being borrowed from, you know, the, that, that's, a, that's an Accord thing. Or, you know, I don't even remember all the complaints, but everyone, everyone came back and, you know, because the car is fairly newish. Oh, yeah, it's brand new. It just showed up about a year ago or so. And uh, uh, people have, have really not been in love with the styling on it. Oh, see, I think it looks fine. I just think it's like ten percent too big. It's uh, it, it's like the size of a five series. Well, the five series is the size of a seven series. So I know. Where, but... you, where are you going to go with that? You know, <laughs> um, and and yeah, I I agree with you because it does seem it does appear to me without going up to it with a tape measure or great big vernier caliper that the five series has grown in size since the e39 since the e34 and the same with the three series the three series has always gotten bigger but as you know and i know and everybody who's listening to this in the united states of america knows we're all getting bigger we're all obese here in this fucking country and if you're in a country where you don't get obese well you'll just have a lot of room to move around in a three series but for us we're still bumping uglies in the car when we're trying to drive them with our buddies you know i mean <laughs> Oh, I'm not thinking about it that way. No, Christ, no, no. I, I, I just actually am reminded of one story that I have to give about an E30. Oh, well, yes. You know, that car, <laughs> that, I tell you what, you put a couple of heavy hitters like you and me in that car, and we're, we're rubbing shoulders. Seri oh, yeah. Okay. Well, actually, well, they want to try to get away from that, obviously. <laughs> and they had to take into account the, the fact that we eat everything in fucking sight. We kill everything and eat it, you know, everything. <laughs> We put, you know, hot sauce on it or fucking, Meat you know, sauce, yeah, yeah, we, we put wash a, it down with Jetty Light. That's right. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're we're out there killing ourselves with the snacks and treats. And uh, so As we you gotta, look over my shoulder. Yeah, I know. I'm looking over there because I'm hungry, but uh, <laughs> I'm supposed to go to dinner with somebody. So, I oh, gotta, shit. All right. Well, no, it's OK. I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm buying. So <laughs> they're going to have to wait. It's probably blowing the phone up. Said I'd call her, but. What are you going to do? But, uh, you know, the G20, if they're saying that they, they, they took this rear end from Lexus, it's because this is an old 7 Series rear end. 
And Lexus took it from BMW, and now BMW. Yeah, it's the Chris Bangle back end. Yeah. 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 Exactly. That's exactly what it is. And that's the thing, you know. I mean, we're not talking about the seven, but let me just put that out there real quick. They went, they went from, and, and and you're not supposed to do this. We've talked about this before on the podcast. They're not supposed to do this, but they took a car that was eh, moderately successful. At not, but not by its own standards. By its own standards, it was a successful car. They built them. They sold them. People loved them. And it's the E38 7 Series from uh, probably, I think, 1994 yep. to 2001. It was, And it's standard. I mean, when you think of BMW, this is the car you picture in your mind. This is the car a lot of people picture in your mind. You know, Jason the, Statham in that fucking transporter yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah, that's the car. And in a lot of heads of state rode in these cars because they made protection packages, which you couldn't shoot through the fucking glass. You know, they were bulletproof. They made, the protection package was awesome. for for hauling around, you know, diplomats and Russian and gangsters. And that, and yeah, and that sort of thing. <laughs> Idi Amin. And, and, <laughs> but this is the car you picture when you picture an older BMW. And then they went and they built the 7 Series car, the E65, that showed up in 2001 as a 2002 model. And it was an absolute clean sheet of paper from stem to stern. Every single thing in that car was different than the car before it, the car that it was supposed to replace. Every Every nut, bolt, and screw, every bulb, every fuse, every system, every the suspension, the tranny, everything was new. Everything was different. And in if you talk to people who build cars for a living, such as people who work at General Motors or Ford or anybody like that, they'll tell you never to do that. That's breaking the rules of making a car 101. It's like the first thing you learn when you go to engineering school. You know, you got to use a tried and true drivetrain in your new body style of car because that's one less problem you're going to have. And they had lots of problems with that car. And one of the things that people moaned and complained about and, and put the car down and insulted the car and, and critics didn't like was the styling of the car. This Chris Bangle uh, styling cues on this particular car. That's the gentleman who designed the car. And it was a radical 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 at the time a very radical departure from what had gone before and a lot of people said they hated it and they but sold the absolute they sold fuck so, out of them they sold so many of them it outsold the car that it replaced two to one three to one i think it was it was, it was ridiculous it was, it was extremely popular the problem was that it was extremely poorly uh deployed and there conceived was, there was a lot of systems in that car that caused a lot of problems. I know I fixed a lot of them. Uh, and so the car's reputation went right into the shitter right away. But one of the things that happened, one of the byproducts of this particular vehicle was that a lot of car manufacturers saw the success of the styling and borrowed it. And, and if often you look, with tracing paper, sometimes, yeah, sometimes they just flat out stole it. Uh, I have seen the styling cues from the E65 7 Series by BMW on so many cars, lots of Japanese cars, by the way. And now it seems like it's it's come back to roost. And uh, the, the, the G20 does kind of have yeah. a little bit of that look about it. It looks like a Lexus. That they Alexis. invented, that, they, that yeah. they should own. That's it, really not a trademark, but it, yeah. it could almost be trademarked. Yeah, the back end looks like a Lexus. The, the front end just looks like a meaner version of the F30. It's like... It's yeah, a little the, bigger, you know? I, I, the, I like the front end of the F30. The, the front of the G20 is still growing on me. Uh, sometimes I don't warm up to a car right away. Uh, I would say a lot of times I don't warm up to a car right away. The F30 is the only car I've really liked since day one. The only car that I work on at the manufacturer I work on that I've liked from day one. Everything else, they could throw them all away. I, I'm, I'm, I can live without them, you know? But they know what they're doing because they, do. we are, they are selling them. I say... We are selling them. I, I have done pre-delivery inspections on all these cars. Uh, really, every car that we've talked about, with the exception of the F, the E36 and the E30, I wasn't around in those days, but I have done pre-delivery inspections on all of those cars. When they're new, they're fabulous, obviously. Yeah. Uh, how well they hold up is another point of contention, and it really depends 100% entirely on the owner and the operator of the vehicle. Uh, I just think that the F30 was... was a good car and right from the beginning and i hope that the same goes for the g20 and and truth be told i'll probably end up driving a g20 because i'm going to be looking for a new new set of wheels probably in about the next six to eight months and i may end up leasing one of those because i don't i don't drive very far 
I mean, I got a two mile drive to work compared to the old yeah, 55 same, mile same. drive to work that I used to have. Wasn't going to be buying anything new to do that. That that wasn't going to work for me. But uh, and the I, three series is sort of the perfect car to do that with. You know, they're a commuter car for an up, upper scale individual, and they represent 30 percent of BMW's annual sales. Yeah, they, I've been told that their main car. The one that they concentrate on the most and the one that they always try to get right and, and work the hardest to get right is the 5 Series. But, we, you know, it, it's it's a package deal. You know, you have to have, you have a 7 for that particular customer and you have a 3 for the, maybe maybe you would call it the entry level customer. I'm not sure I would call it that. But the 5 Series is what they concentrate on the most. But they've all borrowed styling cues from each other so much so to the point that one is just really a smaller version of the other one. And now it's not even that much smaller. No, it, well, if you've seen a new five series, it's, they're they're, it's, they're, they're enormous. Yeah. So you're comparing apples to older apples is yeah. what you're doing, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> and the older apple was smaller. The older apple was smaller. There's no question about it. But but we we need room. We we need room. You know, we're big people. You know, and and it's always you know if you have a small car like you know say we're driving the E30 and we're bumping into each other you know. <laughs> After a while, if I rode with you in a lot to a lot of different places, I mean, usually you're by yourself in your car. But if you're if you're driving people around, maybe you're even an Uber driver. Would you want an E30? No, that would be the wrong car for that fucking job. I actually it? couldn't think of a worse car no, in the world really. to drive Uber with yeah. than an E30. You know, even if you had a four door E30, it, it, <laughs> driving Uber with a four door E30 would suck. It'd be awful. But if you got yourself a new G20 or maybe even an F30 four door, much much larger. Much more legroom, much more, just just better all the way around for that. And that's what's really going on, I believe, with the, the cars, is that early on with the 3 Series, the 2002, the, the E36, and the E46 somewhat, is they were designed for one or two passengers in a backseat. was kind of like, eh, okay, they might grab somebody else to go with them. But, man, these later cars, yeah, that was nice. The, uh, <laughs> the later cars, the E90, not so much, but the F30, more so, and then the G20, have uh, made a lot more provisions for passengers. Uh, they'll have, whereas in an E46, you know, you have almost nothing going on as far as rear uh, heating and air conditioning. F30, there was some more. G20, there's even more. Uh, the entertainment options uh, are obviously, you know, an E46 when it first came out, Bluetooth was just two words that had never been put together before in the English language. Yeah. And now you can't buy a car without Bluetooth, yeah. and everyone knows what it is. But I remember the day when. Somebody said to me, hey, does that car have Bluetooth? And I'm like, what? What the fuck are you talking about? And I had to learn about it. And it was a, it was an option in E46 is built after like 2005, which wasn't very many. So you're not going to see it in E46s. It, almost all E90s have it, but it's a, it was an option. You could get a car without it. Uh, e, F30s, I'm pretty sure that every car would have had Bluetooth. Uh, in some way, shape, or form. And, of course, F30s now are uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, and, yeah. and they have the Ethernet that they use for diagnosis, and they have the Internet on the, on the the you know, in the nav and all that shit. And they have connected drive and Apple CarPlay and all that fucking shit that when it doesn't work drives me fucking crazy. Because <laughs> so I'm a goddamn auto mechanic. Do I look like an IT guy? Get that shit the fuck out of here. And, oh, you know, all the problems I'm having with my car, it doesn't hook up to my phone, and I can't make a call with my phone, and guess what they don't leave with the car when they leave it for fucking problems with their phone? They don't leave the fucking phone. Well, guess what? You might as well take the fucking car with you, too, because we can't fix it unless you leave the phone. You know? It's just a pet peeve of mine, that's all. You know, I mean, I can't fix, I can't fix your phone if you don't leave it. All right, so and that's they're the not going to leave it. They're, yeah. not, they're not ever going to leave it. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you. no, no, it's all right. Let's get away from that because that, yeah. that obviously hit a nerve. <laughs> a little bit, yeah, Jesus. <laughs> well, it's, it's you fun. need a hug, Uncle Jimmy? Well, you know, I mean, if you got one in there. So, but, uh, yeah, you know, BMW's 3 Series has been a great gateway to the brand for millions of people for literally decades. They make good cars. The 3 Series has always been a pretty good car. But I'm just going to end this on one ridiculous thing. What do you say to people who say that Mini Coopers are entry-level BMWs? I say they're fucking stoned. I really, you know... It... it. <laughs> That's all the time we have for today, folks. This has been Grease the Wheels. No, no shit, really. I mean... It, what sucks is that 
you know, we would sell them in the same building in a lot of cases. And people would come in, I have a BMW Mini. No, you do not. You know, did people come in, when, when BMW owned Land Rover, did people come in and say, I have a BMW Land Rover? Well, maybe some jack-off somewhere did. They were just trying but, to make it a little bit more reliable in their heads. Oh, <laughs> shit. I don't know. I Not a fan of Minis. I'm not a fan of Minis. Uh, it's a niche market for those cars. And they're struggling hard because... And I don't have an excuse for that. I don't have a reason why, but they're struggling. And lots of dealers for Minis are closing up. Really? They're going, oh, absolutely. I had no idea. Oh, yeah. I, I think the dealer that I used to work at that has Mini and actually was, I almost say, I almost want to say they were forced to divorce Mini from their BMW building and wow. make them their own building. But, but a lot of Mini dealers are closing up. I don't believe that there's actually, somebody said this to me the other day, and I have no trouble believing it. I don't believe there's any Mini dealers in the state of Tennessee anymore at all that are all closed. Maybe it was Tennessee, maybe it was Kentucky, maybe it was both. Fuck, who knows? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, as, <laughs> seriously, as like a novelty car, <laughs> you know, as a, as a novelty car, maybe for somebody who has one of those big red noses and the shoes that are 16 to sizes too big and wears too much makeup and, and gaudy orange, you know, uh, jumpsuits, you know, a Mini would be a great car for that guy, you know, and, and maybe he maybe he checks off the box for the square wheels, you know. <laughs> but as far as I'm concerned, that's who should be buying those cars, clowns. Because I, 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 I've never seen a car, uh, it really, almost literally across the board, that people abuse and neglect more than a Mini. Yeah. I, I mean, they just had, fall apart. We've had, we've had at the, at the Indy I was at, where we used to get Minis, it was the last place I ever even saw them come in the door. Lucky They you. would come in and they would go, yeah, I know. Well, you know, we didn't. You know, if, I'm, I'm not kidding you when I tell you this. When I was looking for a new dealer to work for, when I was looking for a dealership to go work at for BMW, I went specifically miles out of my way to make sure they weren't a mini dealership also. <laughs> because I do not want to fucking work on them. I do not want to. You know? And goddamn Andrew, shout out to the Mazzy man. Jesus Christ, that kid can't stop the buying them. He had an E90 out there and he had a bad FRM. And I said, dude, there's an extended warranty on them. Take it to the dealer and have him put one in. And he went, and he just went blank on me, which yeah, I've seen that before. <laughs> but he's like, oh, really? And I, I pulled up the, uh, I pulled up the dealer communication and uh, showed him where the where the warranty was. And he was like, shit, I don't even have to do anything. Just take it to the dealer. No kidding. So he keeps buying minis. and But we had a few of them. At the, and you can use any of this that you want. It doesn't yeah. really matter. If it ends up on the cutting room floor, I'm fine with it. But we had we had not one, but we had a couple, two, three binnies that would come into our our uh, indie shop that I was at. And they would say, oh, you know, car runs really bad. It's got to check engine light. And the first thing we would do, we learned this right away. First thing we would do is check the oil. See if there actually fucking was any oil in there. And Oof. guess what we found? No. You know, you'd, you'd, you'd add a quart and still wouldn't show up on the dipstick. So you add another quart and it still wouldn't show up on the dipstick. Oh, that's not and you'd good. You throw another quart in there and it finally showed up on a dipstick. But where it showed up on a dipstick, there's a smear on the end of it. It was just a little <laughs> taste of it on the end of the dipstick, and it needed another quart. So you put in another quart. You put in four quarts of oil and you check it on the dipstick and it's full now. And then you go in and you check the capacity of it and the capacity is four quarts. The fucking thing was empty. It was amazing that it ran at all. And then you fire it up and it's got oil in it and now it runs beautiful again. It's like really seriously, it's a dipstick. Do, do, are there people out there who don't know how dipsticks work? Pull them out, look for the oil on it, see where it stops, see if it says min or max, or maybe little X's through the middle of it, it's where it's right in the middle. And then if it's it below min, as in dry, put some oil in it. Is it that, is seriously, it, Gentlemen, let me know, really. Hit me up on the Facebook or whatever, on uh, Instagram or Reddit, whatever we're using. Let me know. Does this happen to you? Is it so tough to check your oil and add some that nobody's ever going to do it again, ever? It seems... It seems we, like many people are really bad at it. It just... It, I, don't, I don't know what it is. I, I, I don't I, either. I suspect that there's an economic problem there where they're, they're spending so much money just to pay for it that they can't afford to buy a quart of oil. I mean, are they standing in the Walmart going a quart of oil or a can of soup? Which is it? Do I eat or I make the car go? I don't know. Is that happening? I hope not. All right. So, uh, boys and girls, that's going to be it for the makes and the models. And the model was the BMW 3 Series. And we uh, 
we we hope we covered it fairly well for you. I know that there's some stuff that we skipped over and maybe some stuff that we missed and some of it might have been on purpose, okay? So, hey, if you got some comments about this particular podcast and maybe you have a make and or a model of car that you would like for us to well, spit roast on this podcast, <laughs> or maybe hold them up and say, "Hey, this is great." Either way, we can we can go either way with it. Really, I mean, uh, depends we, on our mood. Most yeah, of the time. exactly. But uh, you know, if you got to make that's de- near and dear to your heart, let us know what it is, and maybe we'll go after it and destroy it in your mind, or maybe we'll build it up and give it the do it's it's needed or that's necessary. Um, we want to. What we want to do now is just sign off. We want to do a couple of shout outs to some of the people who have uh, been, befriended us and some of the people that we have befriended who are big fans of the BMW 3 Series cars. Well, we're talking about Dan and uh, Frankie's one of the big ones. And, yeah, uh, Mitch. Uh, Mitch, the, the Mitchapalooza out there. The entire uh, E30 club of Western New York, that's a good group of dudes. Yeah, and and anybody out, anybody else out there who really is a fan of the E30 especially, but the, the 3 Series uh Overall, uh, maybe you're into E46s. Maybe you're just a big M3 guy. Maybe you just bought one for the first time. It's your first car. Uh, we hope you love it. We love them. We really do. Yeah, and, we really uh, do. Yeah, and this yeah. one was easy because we didn't have to do any homework. Yeah, we, we didn't both... have to do a lot of homework. We we we've owned them. We've driven them. We're fans, just like you. And uh, we hope that the the fandom continues. The the love is there, baby. Feel the love. So. We're going to sign off right now, and we always do the same thing when we sign off. We lean into the microphone, and we go, see ya. <laughs>